Good evening, students. This is the College of Complex. And uh, we have a few new students uh, tonight. Uh, and I see uh, and one late arrival there. Uh, let's see. What do I have to explain to you? We have. Uh, uh, without any further ado, then we will hear from our illustrious speaker. Uh, oh, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> 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 Thank you all for, for coming here today. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the motivation. I studied economics at the uh, PhD program at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And uh, when I came back to Chicago, I started to think a lot about policy and a lot about what I'd learned about economics. And one of the things, there were a lot of frustrations I had about the way economics was discussed in the media and in politics through the pundits. And uh, so I started trying to think about what, what's the difference here between the economics that I learned in school and what people are talking about. And it seems to me that there's a, there's a difference between sort of the ivory tower economics and the, uh, the opportunistic uh, think tank economics. So there's, a, there's like a path that, that economics travels from one to the other. And by the time it gets to the think tanks, it really has little resemblance to the economics that I learned. And I learned you know, all different schools of economics, and I'm telling you that the, what the think tanks are doing have nothing to do with, with what those other theories have to say. And so what they do is they put us a lot into a, a lot of false dichotomies. So some of them, like Bob talked about in his announcement, this idea of whether we're for free trade or against free trade, or, uh, you know, different, different dichotomies, whether we're left or right. I think that was, you know, I, I come from a background that would, you know, admittedly be what I would call left. But I have come through this, this study, through this project I've been working on, to realize this is another one of these false dichotomies. We're being targeted into thinking in terms of left or right when uh, that's not really our interest at all. Um, and I think that the Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street has gotten it right by presenting this more as a 1%, 99% issue. And, uh, and I think what, what we're talking about here is, is that there's a certain small minority, whether it's 1%, half a percent, tenth of a percent, or 4%, I don't know. So it's a very small minority who, uh, they're not exercising liberty the way we would think of it. They're exercising uh, a power, the power of government. And they want to be free to exercise that power of government uninhibited by legislative power, for instance, the power of the people. Uh, so that's really where, uh, where my motivation came from for this. And uh, let me, let me uh, just kind of cut to the chase, though. I passed around this flyer. Hopefully everyone got one or your neighbor has one. And the one thing I want to draw your attention to is that this very second line has the, uh, the web address, and there's a lot more detail that you'll find uh, about, about the proposal, about the project that I've been working on. Uh, so I'm just going to try to provide a cursory overview of it. It's very complex, and, and, and there's a lot involved in it. But I think uh, I can do it justice here, uh, here tonight. Um, so, uh, let me jump right into the, this argument uh, that we're going to redistribute the wealth to reclaim our, uh, our rights, our, our, our unalienable rights, inalienable rights. Um, and, and the reason is, what we're doing now, the way we've let this country go, the path we've gone down, has been to establish all sorts of property that's kind of property in, in uh, but it's not like other property, it's not like the, uh, you know, the the tables we're using here or the utensils and those kinds of things, but it's property that no one produced, no one brought to the table. They just sort of created a claim, a paper claim, on someone else's, the fruits of someone else's labor. So it's a property that redistributes income, and it's a property created by the government. So if you actually want to blame government for this, that's really where you could get that out of this too. Um, it's not about whether, uh, another one of our false dichotomies we're often presented is, do we, want to do we want to subordinate ourselves to the market, or do we want to subordinate ourselves to government? I think that's really the, what's being presented to us again and again. And it's like, that's, it's not put in those words, but that really is it. You know? And I think what we want to do is subordinate both government and the market to our own needs. 
And so how do we do that? And that's that's really where we're trying to go at here. So by <coughs> so it may seem strange to redistribute this wealth, this paper claims that I'm talking about, as a way to reclaim rights. But what it's doing is it's it's reassigning uh, it reassigning rights in an equitable fashion, so that some people are we're exercising the power of government because of the piece of paper they hold, no. and then subordinating others without without representation. So what we end up with where we've gone is uh, we've ended up with a taxation without representation. Yes, we have representation in Congress and we have representation in Springfield, uh, but we don't have representation in, in where the real decision making is going on, where the real power is over our lives. And that takes place because of these property claims. Now, I, you, you own your house, you own your business, maybe you own your car, your vehicle. These are, these are not the kinds of property I'm talking about. I'm talking about the control of monopolies, the natural monopolies, and uh, and actually monopolies of nature, the earth itself. Uh, the example I like to give is, you know, if I <coughs> if I put in uh, if I put in the New York Times a public notice that I uh, am staking my claim on the sun, um, should that then entitle me to rents from everyone who uses the sun for their for their daily activities? Uh, <coughs> And that is a, that's really, I, I think, puts it in kind of a stark contrast. We think of it's a, a absurd, but why is it someone can do that with the earth? Why can someone say, I own the earth? They could stake a claim to that. And you might think, well, it has to be that way, but it doesn't. So that's what I've tried to lay out. So I tried to lay out an alternative of how we could do it and how we could actually get there. You know, even though we didn't start out that way in 1776, but we can use this method I'm proposing to get us back on the right path. Um, so when, when I'm, I'm going to go through this at the end, but what you find is once we do this, then all of the arguments over, well, do we want to subordinate ourselves to the government? Are we for markets or not for markets? Are we for government or not for These all fall by the wayside. And all of the things that I think of as the right, that I disagreed with as someone who, I, like I said, came from the left, I can then agree with all of those things. You know, or many of them. I'm going to go through some of them. Um, and, and you see that, that there's so much agreement, there's so much consensus that can be built then, and that what our disagreements are with left and right are really about which way to cope with this plutocratic rule we have. You know, so if, if, we, if we accept that we're going to have plutocrats rule us, in other words, rule based on how much I own of the earth or own of other monopolies, uh, if, if that's going to decide rule us, that's going to reign over us, then we get, well, then we shuttle into left and right, and these are our coping mechanisms. But I'm saying, let's just not cope with it. Let's not, let's agree, we're not going to cope with it, we're going to end it. So, so again, so the flyer lays out some of this, but let me, let me just talk about, it. and I presented this several months ago, it was before the Occupy Wall Street thing began, I think. Uh, and so that, that, that had really helped me, uh, shape this in a lot of ways, and so did the hearing your uh, rebuttals and your questions. Uh, and so let me uh, let me talk a little bit about, so some of you already know where, where this, what I'm proposing, but let me, for those who don't, let me uh, lay it out. So this includes a constitutional amendment. It's a draft amendment to the Constitution, and it's quite lengthy, but uh, we have one of the shortest uh, constitutions in the, in the world, so I don't feel that that's really a big problem. And I call it the political economy amendment to the Constitution because it really takes the best of what we know of political economy today, what you learn if you go to a PhD program in economics, and it applies it to our polity, what the ancient Athenians call polity, what we might call constitution today, but it's it's not a piece of paper, it's the, the actual relations of the institutions we establish. So, the first thing it does is it actually does uh, oppose, impose a one-time only progressive net worth tax, which is basically a redistrib redistribution of wealth. But uh, for most people, they won't, they won't see less wealth, they'll actually end up with more wealth. So, uh, for probably 80% of us, uh, we're going to see more wealth in our hands afterwards. Um, than we have, and we're going to have more control of our daily lives. Now, for that top 20%, you think, well, that's unfair to them, but we're not taking the useful things that they have. We're not taking their yachts or their... Maybe, maybe they won't be able to afford 
the yacht, that they won't be able to afford seven houses or something like that. But, but that's not the aim of this. The, the aim of it is to simply say, okay, the wealth that you hold that gives you power over our, our politics, over our economy, that we're going to take from you. And we're going to do it in an equitable fashion, though. We could just say, if you own stock in corporations, you could, we could say tomorrow, it doesn't mean anything. Um, or, <laughs> but it, those are these are kind of reckless approaches. So uh, you could say that it doesn't mean anything. In fact, if you look back to the beginning of corporations, the Brit British East India Tea Company was a company that had shareholders, but it was the monarch and the parliament of England that set the policy for the company. So you're sh you holding a share in that company didn't say anything about you being a plutocratic elector of the board of directors in that company. It wasn't, you know, you weren't voting based on your wealth. You, rather, the king and the parliament decided what that, com that company was going to do. Of course, there was all kinds of influence and corruption and all that that went into it, and that part of what instigated our revolution here in, in the United States. And, um, but, but, the, uh, but in terms of politics, in terms of the law of it, it did, just because you held a share didn't mean you got a vote. So this would change, change it so we, we wouldn't even have shares, because I do think the shares people hold, they bought with the idea they would get the vote. So we need to address it in, in an equitable way, because that's what government should do. Government should approach things equal protection. That's, I think, a key thing in our, in our Constitution and in the law. Equal protection. So we have to find a way that's equitable to end this redistribution of income that we've, we've allowed to happen for, for hundreds of years without hurting one person more than the other. Uh, we need to find a way to do that. So, so the, the, the net worth tax does redistribute the wealth, and in doing so, ends these monopolies. Um, uh, if then, with that done, then we, then we get back on a path that I think is much more appropriate. So we, we end up with uh, what I call a zero tolerance policy for rent seeking. So rent seeking is the idea, you know, again, like that notice I wanted to put in the New York Times to claim my stake to the sun. So I have to spend, I don't know what it costs to put a notice in the New York Times, I kind of thought, but, you know, say it cost me a hundred bucks to do that. Uh, so that money I spent, that's money spent seeking rent. So once I do that, someone may say, well, why didn't I think of that? Um, and, you know, they spend an enormous amount of money now to wrestle the sun away from me. And then, you know, someone else wrestles it away from them. And so there's this fighting that goes on. So once you establish <laughs> private rents, you establish the conditions for rent seeking. And more and more, we've seen our economy shift. People talk about the service economy or the, or the manufacturing economy. I don't think those distinctions are all that useful. But what they're trying, I think what they try to get at, without knowing it, is the distinction between the rent seeking economy and the productive economy. So, you know, if I go get a haircut or if I go see a psychotherapist, these are services, but they're useful things, you know. But if someone spends their entire day you know, eight hour a day at work, simply finding excuses to deny medical claims. So to keep the income and the wealth in the hands of their insurance employer, well, that's not useful for anybody. It's useful only in that it's a rent seeking. It transfers income from those who deserve the benefit of the health care to the health care insurance company and then touts it in their, uh, in their quarterly earnings report. Look how great we did. Uh, and they can employ large numbers of people to do that. So as the economy shifts to one where you have 20% or 30% or 40% of your workforce devoted to rent seeking, all they do is go spend eight hours a day shifting claims around. And that's much of what Wall Street does. Once you do that, then you have uh, you've placed another burden upon the 60% who actually do the productive work. Because they now have to do the productive work for 100 percent, even though they're only 60 percent, they have to double their their workload just to provide for all the people who are cheating each other out of claims. That rent seeking. That they so, uh, so <laughs> the point is, if we if we then establish in the Constitution a zero tolerance policy policy for rent seeking, so no rents can go private, we we end up eliminating that rent seeking behavior. And I, I leave in there a provision to allow you know, certain circumstances and exploratory. I think these are dangerous too, but I want to be, uh, <clears throat> in a constitution, you want to kind of lay it out in, in a more broad, uh, abstract way and let the law, the implementation of that constitution and the law, 
establish things. So I, I do leave in some room, you know, for instance, patents and copyrights. And these are examples of allowing rent seeking. So we allow people to claim intellectual property in their intellectual products. You know, for instance, I produce this. I put it out there open, you know, public domain. It's yours to, to use. Um, but I could seek copyright protection. And that would be a form of rent seeking, so that I would say, no, any, any benefits that accrue because of these ideas, they have to go to me. And so <laughs> we allow Congress right there. That was a conscious attempt by the framers of the Constitution to allow Congress room to maneuver there, to allow a sort of rent seeking in that area. But I think what, what they should have done also was eliminate it routinely in, in terms of natural resources, another place where rent seeking occurs. And, uh, and in terms of the chartered entities of, of government. So when government charters a corporation, what they're doing is they're chartering, a, uh, they're chartering a collective enterprise. You know, so if you charter, uh, say, Apple Computer, uh, you've, set up, you've set up an entity through the law that is a collective enterprise. People are going to work there collectively, and they, and they collaborate on producing software, basically. And uh, and if you then allow, you know, so there's all kinds of ways you could do that. We've become accustomed to the way we do it, which is we set it up, we allow shares to be sold of it, because that takes us back to the British East India Tea Company, and uh, and then we grant those shareholders um, plutocratic rights to vote on the, on the policies in their corporations. <laughs> so in this amendment. This shifts that and says, no, if, if government, if a government that's already required to be a Republican form of government, which is that language is in the Constitution, that's one of the only explicit obligations uh, uh, given to government, is that it be a Republican form of government, then, uh, then we shouldn't allow them to spin off these sub-entities, create charter corporations that are not also Republican forms of government. Governance. I was kind of brought into to governance to kind of differentiate between the governance in a private corporation, independent corporation, and the government um, that's going to oversee our natural resources and, uh, and other environments. So. All right. So, uh, so when you do that. Now you, you create, all, all the workers then become one, one, one worker, one vote in each corporation. They can now decide the policy. So what you change, you change the directorship to one of a democratic directorship or Republican directorship. Um, you, don't, you don't change the management. It's not worker managed, although a manager is a worker, so it's always been the case. But, but you still have, it, it basically mirrors our, our setup for government. We have, uh, we have a bottom up election of legislators and, and uh, selection of chief executives. And then from there, within the executive, it's top, it's top down. So the executive supervises and orchestrates the president, you know, as commander in chief or as head of the other departments of, of government. He, he supervises and orchestrates what goes on in all of those other departments, top down. So the same thing would happen within any corporation. The, the, the workers would vote through local rule. You know, they would determine how this happened, whether it was through direct democracy uh, participation, monthly, quarterly, weekly, daily. I don't know how often they, they would need to meet, but they would they would form the policies that are now formed by the board of directors, or they would form their own board of directors, one one worker, one vote, which would then form the policies that, that the chief executive implements. So it doesn't change a lot, and in fact, I think there's an opportunity here because. What we've seen recently, you know, or maybe over the last hundred years, is we've seen a, basically an erosion of the control of, of the board of directors, even over the executive. More and more, they've come, become the uh, lapdogs of the executive of each corporation. So they basically just do the bidding of that executive, and then they compensate the executive. They vote whatever policies they want, including enormous compensation for the executive, who, who earn, they earn their compensation usually because of their superior rent-seeking abilities. You know, the, the, the executives who get the most money in the, in the medical insurance industry are the ones who are able to deny the most claims. You know, that's, that's, who, that's who does the best, and that's who gets the highest salary. And, it, and it, it's a very unique thing. I will get into this a little bit, but there's a natural monopoly there. So there's a problem with having that be private. 
Um, and I'll get into that some more later. But <coughs> so, so basically, what we want to do is there's a lot of talk also about government as the uh, as the demon demonizing government. And I think what we need to think about is not separate government and non-government, government and private, say, or public and private, but rather, what are the governmental powers? What are the powers we're granting that we should grant only to government and no one else? You know? So if, if I get to decide uh, when we go to war, how we wage the war, and, and, I, and I do it through a private corporation, would you say, would you celebrate, wow, we made government smaller? Would you do that if I decided to invade your neighborhood? You know, I, I think... Like water. Those are governmental powers, whether they're wielded by a private interest or they're wielded by an executive under legislative uh, control. Uh, another example is a vigilante. You know, a vigilante basically is someone who's exercising governmental powers. They're going out and finding the, the wicked and punishing them. Uh, you know, punishing them and you know, judge, jury, and execution are all in one. And you could celebrate that and say, wow, we just made government smaller. We don't need, we don't need to have judges, yeah. juries, or executions. <laughs> we, we just need rent-seeking to allow people to pursue this, uh, maybe for money. Um, and, and so as you, as you move these governmental powers into private sector, you actually create more and more opportunities for rent-seeking. Um, and now, uh, rent-seeking. Um, so, you know, what I'm proposing isn't, isn't more draconian. I'm not actually outlawing, I'm not suggesting we outlaw rent seeking. I'm suggesting that we tell government that you can't allow rent taking. If you are a government official, it is your responsibility, among the many responsibilities that a government official has, to work to avoid any rent taking. That's your responsibility. So that there's going to be people who come to you and all kinds of wild schemes that. And as a legislator, as an executive, an administrator, or whatever, it would be your job. And I mean, maybe this is already the case, but we need to be taken much more seriously. It would be your job, your prime directive, to uh, to say, no, wait, that that's not that's not for the public interest. You know, that's that's where it becomes rent seeking. You know, is it for the public interest? Is it? Or I hear what you're saying, and I hear what my other constituents are saying, and here's what uh, here's what I'm proposing that would serve everybody in an equitable way. Again, equal protection. So, we don't have that today. So, uh, let me talk a little bit about natural monopolies. So, natural monopolies are something that I, this is where I really first felt frustrated that people are talking about free markets and competitive markets and all this, and let's just leave government out of it. And then and actually asking government to, to uh, support privatization of our natural monopolies. Well, you can't have free markets and you can't have competitive markets if you allow a natural monopoly to be operated privately as a privilege. So AT&T, for instance, when they operate a network, they're operating a natural monopoly. So net, network, there's, there's several things that we know are natural monopolies without, without question, just from, our, from the theory, they're sort of de facto, uh, I mean, sorry, de, de jure, or a priori, we know this. Um, and that's transport networks, so railways and roadways and pathways and uh, <coughs> Telecom networks, energy grids, pipelines, uh, that's pretty much, pretty much it, I think. You know, everything wired, wired or wireless, either one. Um, these, are, these are natural monopolies. So when you, when you make it, it so it's going to tend towards monopoly. It's, it's, all, it's the most efficient when there's a single provider. That's what natural monopoly means. Because of the cost structure of, of the uh, productive process, when you have only one, you'll have the most efficient operation. So the idea that we should privatize that privilege, to me, is to hand over governmental powers to a private interest and then claim you've made government small. You haven't made government small. You've changed the form of government from one that's Republican form with the legislature determining the policy to one that's tyrannical, where the CEO of AT&T determines the policy for these governmental powers. So you insulated it from the, the people, or, or sometimes they actually tout this, you know, the Federal Reserve loves to talk about this. We're insulated from politics. What they mean, we're insulated from the people. We've created a tyrannical enterprise in the Federal Reserve, which is insulated from legislative power. Despite the fact that the Constitution says all legislative power shall be here invested in a Congress of the United States. So, um, 
So these transport networks are a key one. Another one is insurance programs, because insurance, um, the, high, the lo uh, larger an insurance program, the larger a risk fund is, the easier it is to predict the outcomes. If you know two of us in the room here decide to put together a, a, an insurance, a health insurance fund, and we just say we're just going to pay into it, or you know, or what, what the what the opportunists that we hear in politics today talk about, let's just set up our own private accounts. So there you're actually setting up an insurance fund of one. But I'm saying let's let's talk about two people. If two people do it, which is, I mean, the one is completely absurd. But if two people do that, if we each get together and we put in our money on a weekly basis. And uh, we could both be hit by a bus and, and be put in the hospital like next week, and we, but we only put in one week of, into the fund. Well, we're screwed. You know? Or we could both pay in there weekly for our entire lives and just die in our sleep. And then there's this fund there that's, that's kind of superfluous. Uh, we, put all, we, we gave up a lot you know, that we didn't need to do. So when you expand that to 310 million people, it becomes very easy to predict the outcome. And so you can privatize that. You can say, we're going to make a private. Don't worry, if we make a private, it'll be lots of insurance companies. But what you'll run up against is that one insurance company will, will find another insurance company and they'll say, this is silly. If we pool our resources, we'll, we'll do better. We'll be more profitable. We'll report better earnings every quarter at, uh, to the Wall Street uh, benefactors. And so they do it. So they combine. And then we wonder, why are they combining? Well, let's break them up. And that's where I think we get a lot of the why is government regulating, you know, because it is actually absurd to break up a natural monopoly. It's a wasteful thing to do. And you can do that with, with a network like AT&T, Verizon. You can break these up and create multiple heavy bureaucracies over and over again that just simply repeat the same secret, you know, proprietary tasks over and over. And they keep, they keep you know, the information from their competitors. AT&T doesn't let Verizon know how it works, and Verizon tries to keep AT&T, what it's doing, and, and so all this stuff goes on, and they're just basically reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And then when you, so breaking them up creates this enormous inefficiency, and they still, they still report, you say, well, how could it be inefficient? They're both very profitable corporations, but they're, they're wielding this governmental power of a natural monopoly. So they're going to be very profitable. That's one of the things about a natural monopoly. You can basically sit on your butt and you can make lots of money. Uh, you know, if you run the bridge, the only bridge to cross the river, uh, well, you're going to make lots of money. You don't need to advertise. You don't need to bust your butt. To, you, know. you, fix the bridge. you don't even need to fix the bridge. You don't have to keep it up uh, in decent condition. You know, because somebody wants to cross it, they're going to pay you an arm and a leg just to get across. Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, some people say, well, that would be a ferry operation. You know, okay, well, that might constrain it a little bit. But why are we even playing this game? What's the point? Because once you realize, when you have a natural monopoly. It, it, it's a single large bureaucracy that operates it, whether it's a public one or whether it's a private one. And there's no magic that the private bureaucracy can wield that the public bureaucracy doesn't have access to. So it's actually, it's, it's basically a fiction that's sold to us that privatizing a national monopoly will make it more efficient. Um, it is also the problem, again, because you're wielding a governmental power, when it's wielded by government, there's all kinds of constitutional requirements that it must adhere to. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's been Supreme Court rulings on this, although my, my amendment makes this much more explicit. But if government's running something, they can't necessarily look in on what you're doing and, uh, and you know, basically violating the Fourth Amendment. Because they're, when they're running the natural monopoly, they may learn things about you that are considered not really uh, information for law enforcement, but it's information for the operation of this commons. You know, the post office, for instance, you know collects information on, you know, asks you to change your address and things like that. This is, <clears throat> this is not something that uh, you, if you necessarily want uh, law enforcement to be tracking. Because, again, the, some of these protections, I think, which criminal protections, we think of them as only for criminals, but they're also for us. Because if, if you allow this unlimited power for law enforcement, they'll spend every tax dollar they can find on making it bigger and bigger. There's every incentive to do that. And so I think we need to have reasonable limits on... Uh, on what we're doing. Um, again, th th that's part of that, that rent-seeking. But we're actually fighting the rent-seeking inside government. So we, it happens in both places. It happens outside government. We pri you can seek rents by privatizing what was formerly governmental, what was formerly public. You privatize it and you've got it. Or you can burrow your way into government and uh, run you know, the, the prison system, for instance, in a way that, that makes you lots of money. Um, 
and lets you increase the staff and larger and larger. And I would say that a lot of ways the the, uh, the drug enforcement, the whole drug enforcement system, is one created in order to balloon the bureaucracy of our criminal enforcement apparatus beyond anything that we actually need, and it actually gets in the way of real criminal enforcement. So you know, it's, uh, more more rent seeking power. So. So the, again, so if we, if, I don't know, if I were to say you can't run an insurance company, but here, here's what I'm not saying you can't run an insurance company. What I'm saying is when government is going to run the insurance companies and you're free to compete with them, if you can't, you probably can't. That's the point. But now it's a clamor. You're clamoring for privilege when you ask the government not to run a public insurance company. You're clamoring for a special privilege you want for your insurance company to not have to compete with a government one. When we shouldn't, you shouldn't have it in the first place, you know, basically by, by economic theory, you shouldn't be running this natural monopoly yourself. Um, and so, so the, if we were to say no transport networks and no insurance companies, or, or we're going to run them through government, you're free to run your own, but you're not likely to compete with the, the government one, and we're going to run them actually maybe at a slight loss, and we're certainly not going to run them at the, at the huge monopoly profits that monopolists are used to enjoying when they, when they operate these monopolies. We're going to operate them maybe at, at just a break-even <coughs> opportunity cost of capital kind of level, uh, customary rate of return, you know, these, these kinds of... So, so basically, you, you run the, the telecom network at a customary rate of return, that means those profits go right into the public treasury, and it reduces taxes, it reduces the need to tax people because the rents the form of the went to a private interest go, go somewhere else. And then the policies also decide what kind of network do we want? What kind of telecom network would we like to have here in the United States or here in Chicago? You know, these, are, these are things that are very easy. And the internet, I think, is a great example, a great model for how to do this. There's a great way to distribute the power, to decentralize the power over this decision making. So you can have a community decide how to run their network. And all of the communities then work together to decide what kind of network they're going to connect into. And so it's kind of like you connect into the larger network, you connect into the backbones, you connect into the satellites. These are all things that you need in order to communicate worldwide on a global network, but you can decide how to run your own completely independently and autonomously. Just like we do in our homes, you know, you decide what kind of network you want in your homes. You run the wires, you set up the router, you know. And, and, and it's not an issue of a public or private sector. Nobody builds their own router. I mean, few people build their own router. They go to Radio Shack or they go to Best Buy and they buy one. And they plug it in, they set it up, and it's right here. And that's and that, and that are going. So the same, we should expect the same thing of government. That we don't need government to build the router. If it's already built in competitive markets, just buy it off the competitive market. Um, but uh, but we shouldn't expect that the private sector should run the monopoly part. So the key thing is to, to keep government focused on only only providing all those things that are monopoly and only buying those things from the market that are that are not um, not monopoly. Um, so that gives me to the this third example of, of natural monopoly. And this one is not a priori. This isn't something you would know in advance. It's something you have to see de facto, like what, what happens. Um, and I think one of the key examples is in our armaments industry. So almost every armaments contractor, and uh, I think a, a, dozen, a dozen armament contractors make up over one-third of the $300 billion that the Defense Department spends. Just a dozen corporations. And they almost only sell to government. So, you know, if, if, a ha if, if you're buying a hammer, which is sold competitively. You know, I, I could walk into Best Buy, I could walk into the Home Depot and see what, well, this hammer costs $3, you know. And if government buys the hammer, you can then compare it. Well, it's $3 and we're paying $3, that sounds fair. But if you're buying something that's not sold at Home Depot, you're buying, uh, I don't know, an F-16. <laughs> well, there's no way to compare. Well, what, what should an F-16 cost? What does it cost in the competitive market? I don't know, because there's only one manufacturer of them. Right, and and it's a, and it's it's not a low. It's also a cost price, cost plus bidding. So whatever the cost is, they get a customary rate of return added on top of that, which means there's no incentive to reduce the cost, and there's every incentive to re to increase the, the, the amount, increase the demand, to go to war over and over and over again, um, in order to increase their profits, increase the rents that that monopolist receives, and. Uh, 
Again, you, you could, so if, if you were to take all of the, or those 12, say, defense contractors and make them public, in other words, their policies will now be set by Congress, and all of their profits will, will just go into the public treasury. In other words, what the, the Defense Department was going to pay to the armament contractor for profits, won't go to them. It just stays in the treasury. Again, you reduce the burden of taxation, and you still have a large monopoly. You still have a large bureaucracy running this monopoly, but you had it anyway. So you did. You, you can't say that it's become less efficient because now Congress is deciding the policies for it. Rather, they're going to decide the policies that suit us most. And uh, you know, like if, if you're interested in the Second Amendment, for instance, um, you know, it may be that the government can't infringe on your ability to buy arms. But if there's only one armament maker, they get to decide who gets to buy them and who doesn't. You know, so it, they don't have to sell to anybody because they're private. So when you again, you're privatizing a public power, a governmental power, you're losing your rights, basically. So, so I think that's the those are the three ones: the transport networks, the insurance programs, and the armament contractors and other large government contractors. Um, and so, if we were to say to people, "Look, you can't run these, but you can run everything else," what would be the problem? I don't understand. <laughs> How is that an infringement on anyone? Um, and in fact, I, I think it's the opposite. It's not an infringement. It's actually freeing those markets because now the, the operators of those monopolies don't get to tell you how you use that monopoly. You know, they don't get to give, they give, this sounds innocuous, they give volume discounts. If you, if you buy from AT&T and you buy a thousand phones, and, you know, pay a thousand, you know, buy a thousand accounts, to monthly fees for your for your telephone service, cell phone service, they're going to give you a discount. And that sounds innocuous. It sounds, well, yeah, we should have that. But if it's a natural monopoly, you're actually creating other monopolies. You're making it more profitable for the large companies versus the small business enterprise. How do you compete with that? Because they're all getting the price discounts. They're paying maybe a half or a tenth of what you pay for your phone service because that's how the monopoly wields it. So if, if government does it, we, we can have the policy be everyone... Again, equal protection. Everyone gets equal access to that network. No, no, price, no volume discounts. Why? Why? The only reason that volume discounts is for the rent seeking, to increase the markets, and to make sure you get that deal and Verizon gets that deal. So, <coughs> again, you, so if, if we say, look, these are off limits, transport networks, insurance programs, and not that you can't run them, but government's going to run them. You don't have a privilege that we won't run them. Uh, I think uh, that actually going to free market. That's going to free markets quite a bit more. And then, so this is where uh, I started with, with most. Of, basically, it's kind of like the no-brainer stuff of economic theory. This was kind of like, yeah, this is just exactly an application of economic theory. There's, there's not uh, an infringement on markets or freedoms or any of that. It actually, increases the freedom. Um, so then I started looking at, well, what about natural resources? Because that is another thing. I'm a Green, uh, green Party member, and natural resources are an important thing to us, and that also is a monopoly. You know, again, you can't create a separate sun. You know, I like I make the joke, uh, if I claim, you know, my ownership of the sun, you're going to have to come to me, because what, are you going to go, Alpha Centauri? You know, it's four, four light years away. You wait for the energy from that to get here. You're going to be waiting a long time. So again, it, it gives me a great power to have that uh, have that ownership. So <clears throat> it's true of all the natural resources. So again, what can we do to make sure that these natural resources are stewarded properly? And uh, and this is if you look back at feudal government, that in feudal government was kind of the strange government. It was uh, you know this hierarchy of feudal lords, and they were encouraged to. You know, basically wield things as how they pleased, and, and that was kind of the demand. Is, well, we want, we don't want that to happen. We don't want the the uh, archduke to decide these things about our natural resources. We want to decide them ourselves. And so eventually, we subordinated those powers to legislative, democratic, republican processes. And uh, and and so, but when the natural resources were allocated in this feudal way, in this feudal uh, approach where each uh, was given the free reign of the land, and then they could, they could then grant land, subland to another, you know, grant it to a knight, and those knights would then serve you, and those knights would then grant to peasants who would work the land, provide for the knight, so that the knight could do the security operations in this. 
also pay the rents to the superior lord. Uh, so this whole this whole thing went on, and, and so I think you can look at our the American Revolution and think of it. What, there's two different reasons. That the I think the opportunists come in and say, "Look, this is what it was about," and here's what I think it was about. I think it was about saying, "Look, on all of these land, especially on land, on that natural, on these governmental powers, which in feudal in feudal times were called seniorial privileges or seniorial prerogatives, the, the governmental powers." The revolution was about saying we want to subordinate, we want to submit all those governmental powers to the rule of the people, to legislative power. The opportunistic view says no, we want to free those who wield that governmental power from any obligations to anyone. So I hope, let, me, let me try to make sure I understand. So if you are the, the Archduke, you know, of, of some place, the Archduke of Illinois, and uh, you you have uh, all of this. You have what's called a noble obligation, noblesse oblige, you know. And so you you definitely get to decide all these things about the land. But there's a sense that you still have to take care of those on that land if something goes wrong. And there was often a, a resentment that went on. The, the the nobles would feel upset. They had you know they were going to build a second palace, and now they got to take care of this flood, and you know <laughs> resources have to be allocated and difficult ways, and so there was a resentment that went on whenever they had to provide, but, they, but there was that sense, there was, an, there was an obligation, everybody knew it, that they have to the people who live there. Well, with the American Revolution, if you take those natural resources and still put them in the hands of, of monopolists, like the nobles, and say, but you have no obligation anymore. Your obligation is only to make mad sums of cash. Now the people there have no, have no say. So now you, you still you might be the Archduke of Illinois if you own all the land in Illinois. You uh, you can now say what goes on there, and and uh, and you have no obligation. So I think that that's kind of where our I think our revolution American Revolution has gone wrong is in is in encouraging and fostering and even promoting us down that path where we more and more say we don't care whether the people wielding governmental power have any obligation to the people. And as you privatize more and more of governmental areas, you know, privatize the prisons, privatize the armies, turn to mercenaries, do all of these things, you're basically doing that. You're moving more and more into this private realm, which is fine. Like if you want to say the private realm should be free, that's fine. But then the private realm is not going to wield any governmental powers. Let's make sure the governmental powers stay in government and the non-government and, and the, those in the private sector wield only non-governmental powers. And so how do you do that with, with natural resources? Well, with, with like resource deposits, with oil and coal and iron and gold and all of these things that are deposits, it's actually quite easy because you can just simply say that government is going to do competitive bids to find private contractors to extract this stuff. And you can even get down to like, you know, government has a lot of leeway, so they can, they can actually say, well, we have a coal mine, and we're just going to make this uh, independent contractor coal mine. So we're going to um, we're going to hire independent contractors to extract coal, and as they extract it, we pay them at, you know according to competitive bid, and they bring up the coal, and, and and you've got a competitive market in that in that process. And as the coal is extracted, government then conducts another competitive bid to to auction off the coal. But now government would decide how quickly the coal should be exhausted. So if if government's deciding like on a forest, you can decide how how much. But what pace can we exploit this forest and have it regrow? You know, that's, that's something you can calculate. It's kind of a technical decision. In the case of coal, it's not really the same thing. These are, in the case of limited resources, you're deciding, well, how much are we willing to bet we'll have some alternative uh, that will come up before the coal's exhausted, or, or what do you want to bet uh, global warming's not such a bad idea, you know. Or, you know. All of these things go in, and they, and they involve public deliberation, and they should. You know, if, if, if uh, Massey, was it Massey Coal, I think, Massey Energy, if they own the coal mine, if they own the mountain they want to blast off the top of, they'll make one set of decisions, and if, uh, if Greenpeace or the Sierra Club owns that mountain, they'll make another set of decisions. But what we want to do is bring everybody to the table through our legislative process and allow the deliberations to take place to find out what's what's the best approach. And I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I, you'd have to have infinite knowledge, basically, to know exactly how much coal we should use. I would tend towards, let's get off it as quickly as we can. Um, because I, I worry that things are, are going wrong with that. And I think we have, and I also think we have opportunities to do that, because no one does own the sun. 
and it provides us a lot, awful lot of energy. So, um, so we have not not only the opportunity to get off coal, but I, I also worry that we really do need to get off it. So, so we we would decide. But but the reason that we're inhibited from getting off the coal is because there's a rent seeking that goes on. When somebody privately owns that coal mine, owns that coal deposit, and benefits wildly from the sale of that limited resource, there's a, a huge incentive to undermine our government, to undermine our environment, to under, undermine the whole, you know, people in order to, to reap those rents. So, <clears throat> so the other one, the other one that's difficult, all right, I'm going to get through this a little bit. Uh, so then the other one that's more difficult is land. You know, land is a, a difficult thing, but I think um, I think we could also make sure that rents do not accumulate via land by simply using that customary rate of return that I think is inappropriately used for the armament contractors, but could be used for the uh, builders of, of homes and rent and apartments and office buildings and uh, industrial plants and all of these other things. Where uh, you know, if you mentioned back to the feudal times, uh, when when you granted land to a serf. They were given use of the land, which is a privilege in itself. You know, to be, you know, ask the serf who didn't have any land to use. Uh, you realize how much of a privilege it is to have something to use to cultivate. But they weren't granted the privilege of rent. You know, they couldn't, the, the, the peasant couldn't turn around and rent that to somebody else because it was a lucrative deal that they could cut. Uh, and I think we, so that the governmental power was wielded by the nobles. The governmental power was to, to reap those rents. And so we, we need to do the same thing with our land, and uh, we can do that by, so when you actually sell, when you rent somebody through, through money, and they're going to use, use it to sell to someone else, now that they get a little bit of that monopoly privilege in the sale, so they, they, you build a, a building at uh, Michigan and Chicago Avenue, you know, that's a really coveted place, and there's an enormous monopoly privilege that goes along with it. If you get to reap the rents from that, um, then uh, it's very, very lucrative thing to have. So what you can do, though, is, is you can charge enough for the use of that land in order to, to undo the rent. So they still get a customary rate of return. I, I, would, I call it rent control, but it's, I have a problem calling it rent control because what people call rent control today has been so subverted into something else. The, the, the point here is not to set a ceiling. It's not to bring the price down. It's to make sure that whatever the price is for the land the land itself, not the building, but the land itself. Whatever there is for that goes right into the public treasury. Now there's no more rent seeking. You know, you might want to own the land there. Owning land in Chicago and Michigan as a private person is no better than owning it in the middle of the fields in Wisconsin. You know, it's just one one piece of land is another piece of land. I mean, the usefulness is there, but you're not going to reap the uh, reap the rewards. And so the interesting thing about doing this with land time, when is the community holds on to the benefits of their own development. So as a city develops, it's the people who live there that make it worthwhile to live there. They, they're the ones developing the businesses and the, the community centers and, and the, the activities and all of that stuff that makes the city worth living in. But then somebody in Wall Street gets more and more rent the nicer you make it. And so you're paying a privilege to live there in the place you make nice to someone who lives somewhere else and has nothing else to do with it. And so we see the, the value of land is increases dramatically, and that, that makes our, our mortgages increase dramatically. So our mortgages are much higher than they would otherwise have to be if, if, uh, if the land was just zero. If you zeroed out the value of the land, you would just pay for the, the building itself and mortgage that. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's applying into land. So I think, I think there's ways of, of doing this that, it, and you know, just as an example here, if you do that, you're better off than the current situation, like for instance with property taxes, where you have an assessor, and again this creates a rent-seeking opportunity, you have an assessor who decides how much your property is worth, which is just completely, you pull it out of your butt, really. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a scientific fact that you can come up with what a piece of property is worth. It's, uh, it's, it's worth what people have made it nice to live there, and they want to be willing to pay more of that premium to live there, even though they, they're the ones who did it. So it's this kind of vicious cycle. So, with the property taxes, you're encouraged to, uh, you can appeal your, your property tax assessment and then that you hire lawyers that are insiders who know the assessor and, and you get all these deals cut. And that creates a much more bureaucratic and much more 
prone to corruption opportunity than what I'm proposing. So what, what, what I'm proposing is we, we just simply say, look, there's certain, for the people who develop on land, they will get a customary rate of return, and there's every opportunity if that customary rate of return, if, if the development's not happening quick enough, or things are falling decrepit, you could raise the rate a little bit, you know, and they get a little more uh, than they would otherwise get. <coughs> um, so there's a, there's a lot of ways to, to play with that, but it actually removes the rent-seeking opportunity, which I think is a good thing. So let me, let me get to these uh, issues that, uh, that I think of as kind of right-wing, and talk about <coughs> how, I, how I can see them. Uh, is, there, is the time okay? Okay, so the issue of the balanced budget. From a macroeconomic perspective, balancing the budget is kind of an absurdity. Um, because uh, we're redistributing income through this uh, rent seeking, through rents and through exploitation. We, we redistribute income from those who work to those who don't work, who amass enormous amounts of income and can do nothing else with it but loan it. Loan it back to us after they took it from us through these property mechanisms, paper claims. Um, so someone has to borrow that. So a government can borrow it, or we can borrow it in our households. We can create more consumer debt. We can create more federal debt. We can do one or the other. But we can't, we can't say we're not going to have both. Well, we, can, we can get rid of the federal debt and take on more burden as consumers, or we can get rid of the consumer debt and take on more debt as the federal debt. But we can't get rid of both. But with my proposal, we no longer allow the redistribution of income, the redistribution of fruits of labor from people who work to people who don't work. And so they don't amass enormous amounts of wealth in their hands with, with enormous claims to the incomes of other people, the fruits of other people's labor. And then you don't need to have a large debt, somebody, either consumers or government, accruing large debt. So with my proposal, I'm fully in favor of that. I've added this to the amendment, in fact, uh, that it would require a balanced budget going forward. The debt isn't wiped out overnight, the federal debt, with the, the passage of this amendment. Uh, and through the one-time only progressive net worth tax. And then from then on, ongoing, the government has to keep itself uh, in order. And there's no reason for structural debt anymore because we don't have the redistribution of the fruits of labor on a daily basis. Um, lower taxes. <coughs> um, well, I've already talked about that a lot. When you, when you move the natural monopolies and the monopolies of nature and natural resources into the rents from those into government, you create an enormous resource for government to use for whatever government needs it for. Um, people have even suggested it might be so immense that, uh, you know, if you actually set a price on coal, for instance, coal extraction, you set a price that was reasonable rather than what we have today, which is almost zero. Um, if you set a reasonable price on the extraction of coal, then you would actually accrue so much in the public treasury that we might not need income taxes. We might not need sa I'm not saying, like, let's switch to sales tax. I'm saying no income tax, no sales tax, just natural resource taxes. I mean, that's kind of what Henry George was proposing. Um, and it might be so large even that you have, you can distribute dividends to the public on an equal basis. Again, oh, equal protection. So job. everybody would get a dividend because you're charging people from, for the coal to discourage them from using it. And then you're giving it just on an equal basis to everybody else. And that's what's been proposed also for the carbon no. tax. No. Um, so, so we can actually lower taxes dramatically. I'm not saying I would get rid of the power of government to tax, but I do think... Uh, there's a lot of reason to expect that if we move those rents from private interest into public, we would eliminate a lot of need to tax. And it's an interesting thing. Is people talk too much focus on taxes. You know, corporate tax is too low, corporate tax is too high. The, the, the point is, there's some corporations that aren't in on this rent game. They don't get rents. You know, Apple Computer, I mean, they, they get rents from their own intellectual products. Okay, that's not really so much rent. But then there's others like BP, British Petroleum, who they're all about the rents. That, so they're, they're not being taxed. They're being taxed the same as Apple Computer. But first, they're taking from the public common treasury of our natural resources and benefiting wildly from it. And then they're being taxed at the same rate as someone who doesn't benefit first. So, so there's, a, there's that issue, too. Um, <clears throat> smaller government. So you know, th this actually really focuses on the, the Green Party values of decentralization. So it really moves things out to the local level, so that government's there at the local level. But, but again, you don't make government smaller by just handing over the powers of government to a private interest. You don't, uh, you know, what's it, uh, Eric Prince uh, Z or uh, Blackwater. Um, if you give him the power to declare war and wage war for the United States, you haven't made government smaller. 
you've just changed it from one where Republican governance decides when to go to war and when not to, which I don't know if we quite have it, but we're supposed to, to one where we just don't even pretend, you know. So, and some people seem to say, we move it, if you have it, government is corrupt, so let's move it in the private sector. To me, that's not, you're not ending corruption, you're giving up on caring about it. You're, you're feeling so overwhelmed by corruption, you just say, everybody just take it, you know. Just, I, I, and so I know people are pilfering my safe deposit box, so I'm not even going to lock it anymore. You know? um, <clears throat> so that's what privatization, I think, does. Uh, let's see. No, the proposal gets rid of private sector labor unions. Well, it gets rid of the adversarial relationship between an employer, plutocratic owner of a corporation, and the workers who work in the corporation. So you get rid of that adversarial relationship. You don't need the union anymore. It leaves, it leaves an adversarial relationship in the public sector, so there's a reason to try to keep that public sector as small as possible. So yeah, the networks, there would be a bureaucracy running our telecom networks, a bureaucracy running our interstate roadways and our interstate uh, railways, but you would want to keep those as small as possible because there is an adversarial relationship there, and so I also include the right to have a, a collective bargaining in, for public sector workers. But we would keep those to a minimum because you want to you know, not have that adversarial relationship. So, so again, it, it, I'm, I'm, with what I'm proposing is someone who came from the left, I'm saying, let's go ahead and privatize a bunch of things as long as we make sure that the powers of government are wielded only by government under legislative control. Uh, free markets domestically. I think this frees markets wildly more than we've ever experienced because when you don't have these volume discounts from natural monopolists, you don't have private interests privileged to wield governmental powers, the markets can be much more free. People can trade freely and they won't, they can compete, you know. I think some of the reason people think, well, I could never compete, you know. It's because you've been playing a game, you've been playing a game of basketball where your hoop is at 100 feet and your opponent's is at 4 feet. And you're playing and you're losing and you're like, oh, I suck at this game. And then they taunt you and they're like, wow, that, I, you're, just not, you're just not a player like me, you know. You just can't compete. You, know, you go down to Occupy like, Wall Street, that's what the, the South Street guys, when, you know, you just can't compete with us. We're just so good, you know. It's like, no, you have so much privilege, you don't even know it. Your, your hoop is at four feet, and that's why you're doing well. And, and I think, so once we eliminate that, once we actually make it a fair level playing field, then I think uh, competing is not such a problem. Um, free trade internationally. So I, although I, want, I would propose tariffs um, for all countries that don't abide by the same policies I'm proposing for the United States, so if you are exploiting your natural resources, if you hire slave labor, you're, you're automatically going to get a tariff added to you. But as countries join us, join the United States in this policy, we would just eliminate tariffs entirely. We'd eliminate any trade barriers whatsoever. So all the countries that join in this, there's no reason to have trade barriers. There's no reason to have tariffs on, on it. But even if, when we do, as long as we do have tariffs, we'll also have another revenue source that eliminates the need for income taxes. And so. <coughs> Sam, let's. Let's roll, Rob. All right, uh, one more thing. You're, oh, a smaller social thing. Let me, the that, that's a good one to end on. <laughs> you're so, renting the podium, so hurry yeah, up. The, the right wing, um, the right also talks about, you know, wanting, we have too much of a safety net. You know, it's too large. You know, some estimates have put it at a trillion. There's a trillion dollars in the means tested programs. You know, that, I don't know. That, it's, it's much more complicated than that. It's hard to know how much we give to the poor, basically. I, I think that's overblown if you look at it that way, but if you get into it, 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 it but it's probably larger than it needs to be. And that, what, what I'm proposing, when you keep the fruits of your labor, everybody goes up. So if you're highly skilled, your wages go up, you know, because you can now pay yourself, you can compensate yourself more through your democratic workplace because um, you don't have to give it to the rent seekers anymore. Um, and so your wages go up. So. When your wages go up, then the person who's not quite as skilled as you, one level down, theirs can go up, and then theirs can go up, and then you get all the way to the bottom. And somebody who like was so poorly skilled that they, they couldn't really even sell themselves in the marketplace, well, theirs now come up too, and so now it becomes lucrative for them to work, and uh, and it's not, and it's also not done in a way that uh, where you eliminate the safety net in order to further the rent seeking, in order to shove down wages of everybody because the desperate now have to work. Um, but you do it the opposite, you know. So you actually, so we might actually eliminate uh, traumatically uh, a lot of the need for the social safety net just by pursuing these policies. And one more thing on, on that: one of the complexities in this too, you know, when you're looking at a natural monopoly, for instance, a transport network or a telecom network. Let's use, you build the telecom network, and one of the things about natural monopolies is there's a, a average cost to that, 
and then there's a marginal cost. So the marginal cost is how much does it cost to bring one more person on and use that network, to bring more, more bytes over that network? Well, it's almost zero dollars to do that. Um, the average is how much, if you, you talk what, what it takes to build, maintain, and repair, and, and operate that network, you average that out, and that, that's at a higher, much higher figure. It might be the $50 a month we pay for our cell phone use or something like that, divvied out like that. <clears throat> but every time you bring somebody on, somebody who poor, if you means test those who can't, afford it. Give people phones, you know, that uh, you're actually, and, and, you, and charge them $10 a month or $5 a month, you're actually not really helping them, it's not really a charitable thing because you're bringing more people onto the network who don't raise the cost of using the network to anybody, but you bring in more revenues that way and it lowers the, the average that people have to pay. So you're actually helping yourselves. And there's a lot of things in government that are in that natural monopoly realm where we end up, we may be means testing, but we're not really being we can't be talking about our beneficence when we do it, because we're actually helping ourselves in the process. And I think by keeping these things in governmental power, we get policies that are much more favorable to that kind of thing. So, we'll go see Bob Siff has got some questions. Okay, I've got an embarrassing question. For me or for you? Do you, have, do you have a piled higher and deeper certificate? And if so, I, uh, repeat the question, please. <coughs> Does he, do I have a piled higher, deeper, and certificate? Uh, higher and deeper certificate? Uh, Why not? If I don't, I don't, I don't even know. No PhD. PhD. Oh, yes, you never heard that before. I have. I forgot. I have a horrible memory. No, I didn't finish my program. I'm all the dissertation. ABD or right. it's a lot of ABD. Most have feel. I, I think your presentation is a, is a bit clearer than it was last time. I congratulate you on that. Um, <clears throat> though my 80-year-old brain had trouble keeping up all the way through. Uh, nevertheless, I get the big picture, but I, I, I'm focusing on the political problem. I think you're right. I think your system would work. I think you've gotten us down to the essentials in, what, a half an hour? And Lord Keynes took 800 pages, so that's pretty good. Um, Here's the problem. In the election campaign, and you were in one, you ran for Congress, I think uh, you and any candidate uh, supporting your kind of system is confronted by the problem of presenting this complex system, which would, even after the revolution, it would take years of legislation to put it into effect. Uh, the short-term way of campaigning for this kind of progressive or realistic or honest system would be instead of advocating the whole system, for instance, with regard to um, with regard to the banks, the corporations, to advocate legislation that immediately takes control from the banks, who are not too popular now. In other words, uh, propose uh, a piece of legislation that can be understood. Well, here's my question. Okay. Yes. Uh, two parts to the question. One, did you campaign on this program and how did you do it? Number two, wouldn't it be more effective to take particular proposals and campaign on those? I'm talking about the question of what, what served the interests of a Green Party politician to get elected? Okay. That would have been more uh, science Great question. efficient, right? Uh, yeah, I, I was a Green Party kid. I in 2010 for Congress in the fourth district, just not too far from here. Um, and I, uh, I did not quite do that. I hadn't gotten there. You know, I, I, there's sort of things when you when you you kind of think that's too crazy. I can't do that. And and when, it, when I was in the campaign, I was focused on the stuff I knew really well. All the natural monopoly stuff is in there. Transport networks, the insurance companies. See it in there. It's all in my platform. Yeah, in my in my 2010 platform. Um, you know, and it's an interesting thing about like the healthcare debate. You know, I, I don't, whether healthcare is right or not, people people have different ideas of what that means. But I can tell you this: if you say you can't get your grubby hands on the rents involved in insurance, now we can have a reasoned discussion about everybody else. When somebody's not privileged in the room and everybody else here, but everyone's at the same level, now we can have a reasonable discussion about how that healthcare insurance should be structured, rather than one person always saying oh, that's going to hurt my profits. That's going to hurt my profit. You know, like, that's basically my rents, my enormous rents that I enjoy, and my bonus, and all that. Like all of that stuff, that's constantly the the butt in the room. But but that. 
So um, that was all in. So then I started exploring the, the land stuff and the, and the net worth tax. So I was trying to find a strategy to get there, to get rid of these Are natural you saying You were saying these things to the voters? Yeah. I was trying, and, and in, the, in my platform, if you look at the 2010 platform, which is still up there, campaign.ralphburns.com, you'll find that I have in there a strategy of a socialization of the commons, I call it, which was a way to get these natural transport networks, insurance programs, and other sorts of things into the, you know, in a way where we'd actually be spending tax money on it and acquiring the AT&T network and all of these railway networks and things like that. So it was in there, but then with the net worth tax, it was actually a, kind of a no-brainer once I started exploring it. Like, I was afraid to do it, but once I did that, I was like, wow, this net worth tax is amazing because... It just takes care of all of it. It takes care of so many things. You know, like even pharmaceuticals. Like right now we have patents, all these wild patents and even secret intellectual property. If we, if we nationalized all those corporations, we can, we can hold on to the, to the intellectual property that is the pharmaceuticals and make them a public commons or, or have the rents from those pharmaceuticals accrue to the public treasury. Also. Well, so there's a public treasury. Uh, next question. Well, next question. You get to... As far as, let's yeah. say, the uh, means of production or the factories, who would uh, gain the, the profit? Would it be the workers themselves? Or would you have uh, just a single individual or a group of individuals uh, gain the profit? Well, well this type of system that you're talking about. Right, it would, it would be much the same as it is today, except the board of directors, or it could be the, the direct bureaucracy participation of the workers in the corporation. That would be the board of directors, would be the, every worker, the kind of committee of the whole. Who would get the profits? They, they would decide what happened with the surplus in that corporation. They, they might get bonuses that year. They might decide to invest in the new plant they've been thinking about. There might all kinds of things that, they, of course, would have to pay their interest on their debts. Um, they would have to pay their taxes. Things like that would go on, but um, but they would make those decisions through local rule at each corporation, sure. completely independent of, of uh, you know governmental interference. Um, Do people behind you? Oh, <coughs> yes, uh, Dina. Yeah. Uh, what is the likelihood of these ideas uh, becoming law, and what is the trade? Frame oh, time frame, time frame. Repeat the question, please. What is the likelihood and what is the time frame? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. The, the likelihood is, uh, is anybody's guess. I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't really answer that question. I, I do. I'm amazed with what, how every day I come up with some other benefit. that this, you know, I start pursuing another avenue of like, wow, this means we could do this that we couldn't have done before. And, and you know, and I, I'm, I'm anxious to hear people. I, I know there's going to be criticisms of it. I'm having a hard time finding them, despite my studies in all kinds of economic okay. schools of thought. Um, but, so, uh, you know, I, I, the benefits are, are really great, and that, that's the, I think, should be a selling point. We are the 99%. In other words, if we decide to vote for this, it's ours. They can't t the 1% can't take it from us. Um, and we are the 99% in the law enforcement and in the military, too. So it's not like, you know, what's Tim Geithner going to get out his knife and... Pull out a cane and take us on. I don't know. Like, so we can have this. And the time frame, I think, you know, amendments have been passed in a year's time. Um, it get, the amendment gives uh, Congress two years, I think, if I remember the details, to, uh, to finish the net worth tax. But the democracy in the workplace could begin the next day. Um, you know, everything else could happen the next day after the amendment. Okay. Right. Dave Sucker and then uh, Charlie Pedock. Yes, I have two questions. First of all, I know it, guys. yeah, right, Charlie. Get to it. This is Be eclectic. First of all, if I own some land and a valuable mineral is found <coughs> and under it say diamonds, you know, am I not entitled to collect a royalty from whoever wants to start digging for diamonds on the land? And two, um, you mentioned that under your system the workers would own. Uh, on the company or whatever. Didn't the British already try this? Um, I'm not aware of, on the second question, I'm not aware of them trying it. Um, this would be a requirement. Um, you know, a lot of times it's, it, we, we try it in little place here or there, like one company will, will be worker owned or worker managed or worker directed, you know, there's three different things really. Um, I'm proposing worker directed, nobody owns it, same managers as before if that's what the workers want. Um, so, but, but there's different ways of doing that, but um, 
But a lot of times then we'll compare it. So then, especially the banker mindset, the one who, who makes these investments, they say, well, this is wildly more profitable. And what they're looking at is the exploitation of rents that that corporation that's not worker-owned is reaping at the expense of its workers versus the worker-owned <coughs> which says, we're willing to give up a little bit of wild profit in order to just have a dignified life and a fulfilling life. Um, and so when you make those, when you allow those comparisons to me, you know, it's, it's like if you, well, can I make more money off of a born Negro slaves than not? You know, I mean, maybe I could, I don't know. But um, I, I think we should just say, no, we can't do that. That's not, that's not a reasonable uh, way to produce things. All right, what about the yeah. issue of the royalty? Oh, and the royalties. Actually, it's interesting they bring up that term the royalties then goes back to this feudal time when the rents were a royal privilege, the, the seniorial prerogative, to reap those. Um, so no, you, you, would, you would have use of land, you would be granted use of land, any rents from that land would always accrue to the public treasury. Uh, you, if you needed diamonds, you could buy them at the public auction, um, just like everyone else. And so you would have full use of diamonds, free and you know, equal, equitable, equal protection again equal access to the natural resources of the earth, but uh, you wouldn't get privileged access to those. All right, Charles and then I so Yeah, I only have one question, because <laughs> I wait my turn to ask a second question. <laughs> uh, Rob, if at the end of tonight, the owner of the Lincoln restaurant comes to me and says, Charles, in order to meet next week, I'm going to need $10. Uh, where is he? Do you know oh, there he is. Oh. What if I say, oh, no, uh, uh, we're not paying because we passed this amendment and there's a zero tolerance for rent seekers like you. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that's a different, again, that's a different kind of rent. I should have uh, explained that. Um, that's going to trip me up forever because in economics, we use rent in a very specific uh, technical manner. And it really is this, this monopoly income that you receive, uh, previously only from land, but also from eventually from natural resources, from natural monopolies like roadways and toll bridges and things like that. These are these are monopoly income, monopoly profits that only a monopoly can enjoy. So so everyone could charge rent for an apartment. You can charge rent for a rest for a office space or a restaurant space and the, rent, and the restaurant could charge rents too but the, the proprietor of the land so it's still a market driven system but the proprietor of the land is the community itself and its legislative body and it has an obligation it's, it's executive of that government of that community or local government it has an obligation to make sure that the rent for the land the first one to rent the land is high enough that it, it negates the, the uh, extra monopoly profits anybody else is enjoying from that. So there's already somebody who's charging rents on this land, maybe in Wall Street, and they get that. Um, and instead it would be the community to pay 10 bucks next week. That would be perfectly acceptable. You, you could be pedantic about it. Well, like it is your system. Okay. Uh, Ayala has the next question. You realize it has like a ramification to international civil conflict, like who owns the, the sky and the water uh, when we pollute the sky. I mean, it's, uh, stuff doesn't just stay over our community. Uh, but it's a good idea, and, and, and I wonder how, how would we pass it into being it's not enough to say we are 99%. I mean, right now we are the 99% and all our laws and decisions making and, and uh, enforcement, all is made by the 1% or so. Um, the, f the, 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 the problem of Congress being, uh, being run by lobbies, how would you uh, implement ideas that will really take the power and the money from them. Well, I, I, hope, I hope that people can understand this. I hope I'm, I mean, I'm doing my best. I'm not the best at this, but hopefully others will, go, you know, the light will come on and they'll be like, I understand what Rob's saying. And, and they'll start to talk to other people. And eventually lots of people will understand this. And then this can be the basis for an electoral politics, you know, that we can start to, the Green Party and independents and whoever else wants to join in with us can start to pursue these policies and get elected 
based on this because we I'm going to I'm going to go into Congress and I promise I will propose this amendment or I'm going to go into the Illinois legislature and I promise I will ratify that amendment. And it becomes a way to bring people together. You know, again, because it eliminates this left-right, I think it helps eliminate that left-right distinction and really solidifies us at 99%. We're going to get bring down taxes. We're going to you know, eliminate much of regulation that's only there because we're giving governmental powers to private interests and now we have to regulate, we're trying to regulate them. It's like if you gave someone your, use your house and then, even though you were living there still, and, and then you had to figure out some way to get them to behave nicely in the house, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, Silas has the next question. And then Bill Went, Sid, wait a minute, Sid, you had a question before. Yeah, I had a question. Bob Merrick. William McKinley. Okay, my question is based on commerce, in commerce, um, the contract rules. Okay, so in a situation like this, you're saying the government has some some type of um, agreement with the public on a certain level, but each individual can have a contract between, you know, either corporations or each other. So wouldn't that supersede because the contract is king? And he who writes the contract wins. Or well, yeah, I mean, this, I think, frees up commerce. But Repeat the question, please. It, it, the question is, doesn't contract supersede a lot of this other you know, political and, and law? Um, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, in, in the states, you know, the Constitution prohibits the states from interfering with the, with the uh, contract, you know, which is kind of interesting because um, the right, right to work laws do that. The right to work laws in the states actually say you can't create a contract between an employer and a union that, that makes it a closed shop. So it actually violates the Constitution to pass a right to work law. But it doesn't prohibit, the, the Constitution doesn't prohibit the federal government from doing it. You could have a federal right to work law. I wouldn't want that, that, but you could uh, in our current constitution. Um, but I, and I think this actually lets contracts be what they are. But it, it's saying one exception. It, it's well, it depends on how you look at it. Natural resources are off limits, including human beings. In other words, I am the I am the steward of my own body. Right. You can't make a contract in me. Um, you join the army. <laughs> the government can do that, and, and as a corporation, a bunch of workers can get together. And we can decide how to compensate each other. We can we can create those kinds of contracts. Right, right. But you you can't uh, you can't exploit somebody else. You can't uh, engage in that kind of contract. You can't. For instance, even the Thirteenth Amendment says you cannot sell yourself into slavery. If I became destitute and, and bankrupt, and the one way out of it might be to say, well, I'll just sell myself for the rest of my life into slavery. There, it's done. And the federal government would say, no, that contract is not valid. We will not enforce it. In fact, that's a lot of what contract is, is asking government to enforce it. You know, what kind of contracts you can have or what kind of contracts government will enforce. If we won't enforce it, the government won't enforce it, then you're out of luck. It's based, it's based on the maximum law. All right, Bill? Yeah, did I hear you correctly that the present district uh, allocation of wealth is basically a redistribution? Right, because we allow certain kinds of, of contracts, because we allow certain kinds of contracts, certain kinds of uh, employment arrangements, certain uh, rents, a uh, private privilege in rents, it allows, if, if, you know, if I can own something and never have to lift a finger, I'm obviously getting something from somebody who is lifting a finger. You know, the only way wealth comes from is it comes naturally from the earth and the sun, and, and then we intervene with our labor and, and divert it into other ways. So that's the only place wealth comes from. So if I don't do that, if I don't do anything, then I'm getting it from somebody else. And so that's on a daily basis. And I'm not. And this doesn't get rid of that entirely. It allows interest on, on loans, and, but it gets rid of the, the worst of it. It gets rid of the parts that there's no reason for this. Why do we have non-democratic corporations? Why do we let a democratic, like the, the king in, in England could create a monarchical British East India Tea Company, but why do we allow a republican form of government to likewise create a monarchical or plutocratic corporation. That's the big flaw in what we we misapplied our constitution, I think, and, and allowed that to happen. Um, all right, Bob. Okay. Bob, you're, you're an economist, and so I'm going to assume that you would agree that wages are set by the labor market and not the goods market. 
a company uh, is hiring a service, if they have somebody do their lawn, they're paying for that service. If they get a loan from the bank, they pay interest, that's they're paying a service for the use of that money. Okay, and so everything they buy, if they buy a machine, or they rent a machine, they're renting this machine to, you know, cost. I would say all, all markets are interdependent. So if and they, they have, they're dependent on the legal structure. So if they if they have lab, they have labor come in and, and operate their machinery, they're paying labor that they're paying a, a, for that service. To have them come in and operate their machines, they're paying for a service. Why then does that labor feel that it has a claim on the profits of the company? They're being paid for their service. Why do they have, why why do you think that they have a claim on the profits and that they are somehow that they are a victim of rent seeking, you know, by uh, shareholders and you know, somebody got together and put this yeah. company together, designed the plans, got the building together, they hired the accountants, had the uh, public relations, the brand, all that stuff, and all of a sudden some you hire some guy at the street, you're hiring this guy to perform a service in, in the free market. Your question is that. Yeah, what makes him what makes you think that he deserves uh, <laughs> he should be deserve he should be paid five times more because of all the oh, profits. Oh, all right. Right. Ten times more. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, I'm not that's not a, I'm not even talking so much about the rights here. I, I, I think it's questionable why we should redistribute the fruits of people's labor from those who work to those who don't work. That's that's a that's a reasonable question to ask, and, and this and I'm asking it. But even more important, once you do that, once you redistribute the fruits of people's labor to other people, you create all of the problems we have of structural debt, of of uh, you know this the structural debt, which is debt that has to grow, will continue to grow and will never go away. Why would why would we want that? And it, it also ruins all the other market signals. All the things that are good about markets are ruined by the distribution of, of the fruits of people's labor in this way that, that, that lets some people amass enormous wealth in their hands. that Not wealth they can use, it's just wealth that they get to receive incomes that they then loan back to the people that produce the things. So you, know, you produce all the goods, somebody else owns them by default, and then they loan you the money back to you to be able to buy them. That's how our economy works today. It's, it's an absurdity that I don't think we should accept. Ivan? Yeah, there, there was a prior question which assumed that profits would be made by the new corporate structure. Uh, and, and my question kind of goes to uh, the yokes of uh, uh, regulation, if you will, your system would impose on the leadership of a corporation as it maneuvered in the marketplace. And, I mean, well, aren't you putting those corporations at stake for their survival in a tight uh, market? Uh, by yoking them with uh, layers of regulation as they try to survive? No, I, actually, I, what I'm proposing eliminates most regulation. The regulation of the corporation... No, but as the leadership, you're, you're, you're saying... I'm following up maybe on Bob's point that you... you, are, you Labor is stepping in with a veto or uh, at least a say in the, the direction... The legislative power over their own collective enterprise. Okay. Uh, how, That's what I, I want to know. But the point is, if the system doesn't survive, no one has a job. Uh, and that's what my question goes to. If, if you're strapping, if, you're, if your no, system, system imposes, yeah. Uh, well, again, it's, it's if, if you're tying the hands of yeah, uh, the uh, you know decision makers as they try to make a maneuver in the marketplace. Uh, look, I'm not saying that, that some companies won't fail, you know, and that some workers might get uh, overly okay, confident like in, right this, now, like, in this okay. situation. And they, then that one company will fail and another one will do well because of it, because some, some workers were, were more uh, responsible. And I, I have a follow-up question. Okay, and, they're, they're, you, and wielding their legislative power. But, um, but I don't think we should, you know, I mean, that seems to even go against the whole market proposal, which is that we should, work, you know, we should not allow anything to ever fail. I mean, some, some, some companies will fail. But, uh, but, it, but they're all going to be in the same environment. So you're not competing, again, you're not competing against companies that, that don't have to listen to their workers and companies that do. But they are the law, listening to them. I mean, uh, we allow them. Does that answer that question? Uh, well, well it, it, part one of it. The, part, the only government part, regulation yeah. here is, is that they have to conduct themselves in a Republican form of government. So in other words, if, if somebody said, I don't, let, I don't care what the workers, if some CEO said, I don't care what the workers say, I'm going to run it wherever I want. That's the only time you get government intervening in that. But and probably through okay. civil suits or something. Wes Weiner and then Mike Foley. There you go. 
Having been through the 2010 congressional elections, what's your perspective on the 2012 Congress elections? Uh, actually, I, I've, I've been considering a run, but I haven't been following things too closely, and, and uh, there isn't much of interest that I've seen so far, you know, people running in, 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 for Congress around here anyway. There's no Senate race in Illinois this year. So it might be uh, Nancy Wade is uh, proposing to run. Oh, yeah, I've I heard, heard of that, too. Um, I don't know. No comment. <laughs> I want to ask you about the net worth tax. Yes. A lot of entities with enormous wealth, whether it's a person or a pension fund or an insurance company or a bank or even corporations, some corporations have enormous net worth. When this tax is put on their net worth, where are they going to get the money to pay the tax? Well, it's actually it's a tax it's a tax on net worth. Um, so it's not necessarily money involved. It's it's basically you take people's assets and you subtract their liabilities, and they'll be laid out in a certain manner. And the idea would be that eventually you would do it in such a way that every stock would no longer exist. You basically the tax would take everyone's stock. It would take everybody's uh, personal credit instruments and federal treasuries and it would be all in an equitable way but government would end up with all of those in their hands all those pieces of paper those paper claims and, and ownership of land with natural resources and royalties and all that other that would all end up in government's hands they would just stick it in the shredder at that point so it's an equitable way of eliminating those particular paper claims on the fruits of other people's labor in an equitable manner okay all right say we do adopt this system of yours and it supposedly would work have we not tried this in the past with things called communism and socialism and they went back for example 1989 and they kind of went back to a market economy and the second thing is if the government took over the assets anyway what would what what would stop the very bankers from Wall Street to become the regulators of your new system? Yeah. And enrich themselves through bribery. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the first question is, um, again, I think you're, you're caught in this dichotomy of free markets and non-markets. This is more free market than we have today. I think unambiguously this is more free market than we have today. Because the, the governmental yeah. powers yeah. over natural monopolies now are wielded by government. And you, instead of distributing the power through, like, through competitive markets, if you're you know, buying and selling water bottles, you can distribute the power over that through competitive markets. Right. Somebody else can jump in there. But when you have a monopoly transport network, you can't distribute that power. So the way to distribute the power instead is to bring it into a government, make it public, and you distribute the power through legislative representation. Taxation only with representation. Right now we have taxation without representation. That's what the rent seeking does. And then the second part of your question was, uh, I'm forgetting what. Uh, As a corollary, how are you going to lay off workers in a collective enterprise? No, but that wasn't the question. No, he was asking about it. He said, hasn't I was, hasn't I was asking about how oh, the very people who are controlling the resources, what's to prevent them from going into government and controlling the very same thing? All they'd have to do is take off their coats and say, I'm not no longer a communist, I'm now free market, and they get their they okay. still have their same power. Well, I mean, if you think that this is socialism or this is communism, then I, I don't think this has ever been tried. So that means that those places that tried communism or socialism weren't trying, they were naming it that and not trying it. Like you might say the United States named it democracy but didn't really try it. Um, <clears throat> but and in terms of how to decide, you know, when, when the workers control an enterprise, it doesn't mean you want somebody working by your side that doesn't do their, their share of the load. In fact, you want it more. So there's all this talk about a nanny state. Right now, I think we're talking about we need the nannies of, the, of Wall Street to tell us how to run our own collective enterprises. And without those nannies, we'll just be irresponsible. And I think to be, to be Republican citizens requires that we give people that power of being a citizen including in the daily life of their, their workplace. You just yeah. need to get rid of them up. Never mind. Okay. I'll address it in the rebuttal. I'm sorry. Have you had a question before? Yeah. I have not. Okay. Have you? I have not. All right, then you're recognized. Um, then, uh, Jim Callahan. Did I understand correctly that you would do away with copyrights and patents? Uh, that's the first question. 
What is your feeling about copyrights and patents? Could you clarify that, please? Sure. Um, no, I, I was actually making the comparison that that Constitution allows a granting of, of royalties in intellectual products, a temporary. It makes it clear that it's temporary. So I used a parallel in my proposed draft amendment to allow a, kind of a broad, general form of, you know, for exploration or settlement of, you know, but I think there's dangers. I, the, the fact that we settled the West through rent-seeking created some of the, the viciousness of, of our settlement of the West. If we'd done it in a different way, I think it would have been less destructive. Um, so I, I'm worried about that, but I put it in there. So as far as patents and copyrights, I think, I think they're being abused today. I don't think they serve the purpose they were meant to serve, which is to induce people to do innovative things and then to get to enjoy some of the benefit of that for a period of time. Instead, they're being used to basically create enormous monopoly profits from pharmaceuticals or from, from operating system makers. And so one, like one of the things I think we could do is it, we'd still have patents and copyrights, but it'd be toned down and work better, I think, maybe work better. But one thing we could do with this net worth tax is hold on to things. Like, so two things I would do is keep, maybe two, two three things, I don't know, just keep Microsoft Windows, the latest version, and the Macintosh operating system, the latest version, and just put them in the public domain or bring them into the public commons. No, no. Call it Linux. Right. Now, Apple and Microsoft would continue. They would know that stuff better than anybody else. And they would continue to develop it much faster than anyone else. But, but suddenly that would be in the public domain, and now we could develop. And they would tone down the monopoly power of those, of those monopolies. My follow-up question is, let's say something like this were to immediately go into the public domain. Why would logically stifle innovation? Why would they want to, why would they want to even you know, see, things better? If we got rid of patents and copyright, we might stifle innovation somewhat. But I think what our problem is, we, we should recognize that all property is both a, there's a common and an exclusive use. You know, so there's always, the street is the common and my house is an exclusive use. Same thing with, we've neglected that in intellectual products. Intellectual products have their patents, their exclusive use patents and, and, and copyrights, which give a rent to the people <coughs> who have those. But we have neglected the commons. And I think well, part of in my 2010 campaign, I included a proposal to have a public, a federal commons in intellectual property, intellectual products. Because the federal government basically does a lot of development, and then they let the pharmaceuticals take the benefits of that. They patent and copyright those things. Or they, or they don't do benefit, they don't create intellectual products where they could, that would actually lift burdens for everybody, like filling in open source software gaps and things like, you could have very small teams, maybe 10 people, how, how much would that cost? Budget out of our whole federal budget, let's hire 10 software programmers to do great operating system open source development and see what that does. You know, so now you've created an intellectual product commons that suddenly everyone else can, and it would be not GNU, like, like Linux, I'm saying full free, free public use. As they develop stuff, you can use it proprietarily and go in off different direction and patent it, copyright it. But I thought that was called, uh, oh, right. get, I thought that was called yeah, Ubuntu. Rob, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask you some question. Uh, on, on your take, I'd like to bring this down to more of a global, you're on a global, I want to bring you down to a local level here, okay? I, I hear all this about your monopolies and the rents and all this business. Uh, my question is, my question is, is a two-part question. Number one, I want you to comment on the rents of the Skyway, Chicago Skyway. Your, I don't know if you're a big proponent of the previous mayor Daly, but his, and also the parking meters business. What, what, what you feel happened, and then what should have happened, and what you can do to reverse those ironclad contracts. So if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, this would be the kind of thing that this would, this amendment would prohibit all the federal government and the state governments and all local governments from ever doing something like the Skyway deal, the Midway, the proposed Midway Airport deal, and the parking meter deal. And the net worth tax, again, serves as an opportunity to reverse those overnight so that you say, okay, Goldman Sachs is their hand in our parking meters. Now you don't. You know, and, and it's all part of the net worth tax. They don't pay extra because they, they engaged in this improper activity, but everybody's taxed at the same progressive tax rates, and we hold on, among, among all of those things we hold on to, we put in the shredder, we hold on to the, the, the right to take our, to run our parking meters, and we put that in the shredder too, at the local level. <laughs> same thing, the cables companies, the television. No, it doesn't quite answer. I want to know what, what you feel happened and then what you would do to reverse it was the other thing. What you would have done them do it right the right way, and then what would you do to reverse it, being that they have iron-clad contracts and they've been paid already? 
So they, you know, they've already, the city's been paid. So right. you're, you're kind of you were paid for too. Right. No, no, but the that <laughs> keeps making videos. I should have moved ahead. Should I answer that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it was improper because these were natural monopolies and Goldman Sachs and others used their own monopoly, their monopoly power. I'm just trying to see it. Used their monopoly power in order to, basically their monopoly power over our finance system, which also my proposal addresses, but I didn't talk about, to basically hobble the city and get us to accept a deal to give up our more of our natural monopoly control, more of our governmental powers to them. So they now decide, you know, uh, you know, and, and part of the argument is made that, well, if you privatize it, you can make it, um, you can make it uh, so the market signals are there. So they charge the right for parking meters, but there's really no right answer on how much to charge for parking meters. That's really something that really belongs in a deliberative process. And uh, that's where it should be. And, and I think we should, but we should calculate, there's a technical aspect to it where you can calculate, well, what is it? What would we have to charge to make sure that there was always a space, you know, somewhere in, within two blocks, or on average there's a space somewhere in two blocks? You know, you can do all these calculations and then use the deliberative process to decide what's important and, and to the people, and, impo and implement that. So Goldman Sachs instead looks at it and says, "Well, how can we charge money to make the most money off of these meters?" All right, uh, Silas King. Okay, um, we do consider money as being one of these pipeline monopolies. <laughs> What? The monetary system? No, the dollar itself that the Federal Reserve Bank prints. Money and money. Yeah, that, that's part of the proposal too. I, this, this does away with the Federal Reserve and establishes a credit union of the United States that uh, both offers um, a public option of a checking account for everybody, no charge, no matter. What I'm saying is the dollar itself, the two dollars, one's a Federal Reserve note and the other one is lawful money. So the money that the government prints, instead of having use of a Federal Reserve note, you understand what I'm saying? I think I understand. You're talking about the Treasury issue. Right. Right. The, the, there would be no Treasury issue. There would be a credit union in the United States that issued money. There would be no Federal Reserve right. issue. There would be no Treasury issue. We could, you could, uh, we could use napkins here in this room if we wanted to use for currency. Again, it allows a decentralization. The thing that people don't seem to understand, I think, about monetary policy monetary systems, is that if government, as a natural monopoly operator, provides a great monetary system, then there's no, ben there's no benefit from us coming up with something else. It becomes so easy to use a well-provided mo monetary system that we don't want to use napkins here, because it, the napkins get wrecked. And, and but you haven't and addressed, uh, what I'm saying is, would you still have the Federal Reserve? I, I did address it. There'd be no Federal Reserve and okay. no U.S. Treasury right. issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. But then who owns right. the five trillion that we owe? Right. There's no owe. We don't know anything after this amendment passes. We, the, 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 the federal debt is wiped out overnight. Right. Right. Really? Who oh. <laughs> With the net worth tax. Okay. Uh, with the um, my question is, um, how would you plan to take all these products from uh, Microsoft and Apple Computer <laughs> Take all the property that people own that uh, have oil under them and coal and that sort of thing, and make that into, um, you know, like owned by the government or controlled by the government. How do you plan to go through that process? Well, Would I mean, that be just like a like seizing all these assets and saying, "Come yeah, back, guys, you're out of here." Actually, our, our law, our legal system is based on British common law, which is based on Roman law, and it was there's it was, it was a long tradition here. And the, the legal system we're under today. The states grant property to people. They, they grant the property, just like the noble lords did before. Um, and some, and in, in the East, the noble lords did it too. In New England and, and the Eastern states, the, the, the former colonies, those were all grants of the king. And, and they said, okay, once it's granted, now we can alienate it. We can change hands. We can change hands. So that was an innovation. So you can just come in and say, okay, we're taking this all back. No, no, we already have it. We already, the states already do control our, the natural resources. And they make grants to them. And they allow people to transfer those grants. And, and they, this would simply say, you can do that. You can continue to transfer the grants. There's, there's guarantees, uh, like a, there's a political economy bill of rights in there that make sure that you're free to transfer those rights. But you cannot earn any rents off it anymore. That's the key. You get free use of it. You can even alienate it. And, and when you alienate it, there's, an there's a new opportunity for community governments to intervene and say, no, we'd actually like to keep that here. Uh, but, uh, but 
you know, that, that, that opportunity is there, but, but you can still alienate it for the most part. All right. Uh, let's see. Is there anybody who has had a question? Let's go to rebuttals. All right. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left before 10 o'clock uh, when we should begin our rebuttal period. Uh, let's just start. Tennessee students, it's going to be a little arbitrary. We'll write one questioner. Sid, uh, you had the first question, I think. What difference in your system and socialism, or you just don't want to call it socialism? No, I, I don't. If you want to call this socialism, then my question would be what's your problem with socialism? I mean, I, I, there's, 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 there's markets here. Uninhibited markets less inhibited than they are today because we don't have natural monopolies inhibited. Them. And it would be the responsibility of the government to provide those natural monopolies in a here. utilitarian way that serves everybody in a reasonable fashion. So that's all there. There's all these markets. Um, it, if, I, in some ways, I think you could call it, you know, as I looked at it, what I was trying to get rid of was, was capitalism. And what I mean, I, was, I define capitalism as the subordination of all human concerns to capital. To turning money into more money, turning value into more value. That's what I, I don't mean markets. When people say capitalism has free markets, that's not how I use the word. And I think to use it that way blocks us from using the word that's very important to us because it's an insidious thing we need to talk about. And if we can't talk about it, we can't address it. So capitalism as the subordination of all human concerns to turning money into more money, that's what I first aimed at doing. I, I, was, I wasn't thinking you know, I'm going to make the socialist government here. When I did that, I thought, well, you know, you might call this socialism. It's not the socialism that the Soviet Union had. It's not the socialism, you know, I call capitalism in China, uh, you know, or any other socialism I know of. But it, it does say, once you get rid of that subordination of all human concerns to rent and exploitation, you might call it socialism. I don't know. All right. Uh, now I'd like to know how many people have remarks to make, uh, questions to raise, whatever. Uh, that you will have to do in the rebuttal process uh, by taking a seat uh, behind <laughs> the, the podium yeah. here. And uh, <laughs> how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen at least. Uh, all right. Five minutes uh, each. Let's go. No, it's three minutes. It's, that's about twenty-five four. minutes each. Four minutes. Four minutes each. That's the maximum. You don't have to take up your full four minutes, but uh, but you have that. Filthy rent seekers will. Okay. <laughs> Are you a filthy Frank? rent seeker? Aguilar. <laughs> well, let's thank our speaker. Yeah. As I made perfectly clear the last time Ron spoke, I do in fact own the sun. And my Marge, my agent and wife will be around to collect the uh, rent due to each of you according to your usage of it. Nice. Uh, Tim and Sid brought up, the, and, uh, brought up the question of socialism, communism, and so forth. There has never been a communist country in, in modern history. Never. There have been socialistic uh, nations that, char that had some of the characteristics of, uh, of communism or socialism, but there are there has never been a communist or socialist country in, in the world. There has been a well-fought and, and successful, so far, attempt by capitalist countries, capitalist nations, to defeat any semblance of communism, socialism, or socialisticism, if you will. Thank you. Socialist. Hey, what's remedy? <laughs> Get yeah, my first question was uh, if we implement these changes that they were suggested, and I, I am desperate to find new ways to govern ourselves. But uh, what about the peoples of the world? Yeah, I think that uh, these earths contain all of us, creatures born in the warmth of the earth and, uh, and evolved with the tolerance of time. And uh, it seems like we are. Uh, 
have taken control or possession of all these things that, that I don't know why or where this ideology of that we can own this uh, piece of the rock. Um, uh, these hands of mine, and all your hands of yours, and your own intellect, are the ones who build the corporations that these men thinks that we don't have the right to earn a decent salary. He, he is, he is uh, 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 a total uh, distortion of what the human society should uh, aim to. Uh, the corporation without the social values that uh, the speaker mentioned it's not a corporation, it's a monstrosity. It's what we see in, uh, in Argentina. There is a group of people that they are born, when they get to be three or four or five years old, they go into the salt mines, and that's all they know, and they die when they are about 22 or 24 years old. Uh, they work for hours a day, and uh, they collect about 50 cents a day. Uh, the product of their work rep uh, represents thousands of dollars per day to the company to own the bags that they put salt in. This is the world that this man uh, proposes because these people couldn't demand any more salary than the 50 cents that is not even good enough for a good food and it's not good enough for education or anything else. They have no water, no running water, no schools, no hospitals, no anything. This is the world that this, wants, this man wants to create. You. No personal you. Yeah. Yeah. What, this is, this is the world that no is. Personal. I mean, I, 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 I am yeah. not being facetious. I am, I, I, that's how I see it. This is the world that this man wants to create. Lynch. Um, Let's get him. <laughs> so, so um, I don't understand. I am, I am. Uh, I lack the capacity to understand the economics, how they function. I, I couldn't understand that there was many, many people in this, this group that trying to explain how the money enters into situation, how the Federal Reserve Bank, and I still so foreign to me to understand. But one thing we know is that the sun produces the energy or produces the food that we use as energy. The sun stores in the entrails of the earth the energy that is produced through billions of years of photosynthesis. And how is it that we don't understand that as well as the energy that comes from the sun, the money that circulates to make this society function is that energy that has to flow as easy as, this, as the energy from the sun flows and bathes the earth. That is the purpose of this, this, this exchange that we need these tools to exchange. But how is it that these tools of exchange, that is the money, have been appropriated that this man who owns the sun, uh, how is it that that money is not, is not not owned by anybody? I, I, I would like to know. No, there's so much here. Our speaker speaks about his having filed or could easily file a claim on the sun. Well, in order to, a claim is worthless unless you can enforce the use of your claim. <laughs> to do so, you have to build the disk the size of the, of the moon and park it exactly opposite the moon on the other side of the earth. So we have a couple of full eclipses all the time. That's obviously not economically possible, and therefore the whole analogy is worthless. Uh, I'd like to point out, too, that uh, he talks about natural resources, and the value of those natural resources should belong to the common will. Well, in a way, I don't object. But frankly, through the history of the sale of natural resources, 
most of them have sold for, on the market for very little more than the cost of production. Under normal times, gold mines close when the cost of producing gold, which is still there, equals the value in the marketplace. Today's $1,500 price for gold merely means the market has discounted the future values of the substance. This is just like when Roosevelt raised the price from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. So he didn't add any value. He actually discounted the present value in the future. It's a reverse think type proposition. Uh, frankly, we have a speculator element right now. And thank heavens we do because my little IRA would not have lasted so long except I got into gold exclusively several years ago. But now that I've passed my expiration date, being 80 years old, I've had to sell it all and pay taxes on some of it. Nonetheless, I, 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 I extended its value for years without having to pay any taxes because, of course, it, it was anything I did within my IRA was tax-free. But this is bull. Resources sell for very close to the cost of extraction, whether it be coal or oil or what have you. Uh, on the issue of intellectual property. What the miners get out of oil they, die, they die mining this shit. On the subject of intellectual property, <laughs> is, he suggesting, is he suggesting that a poet or a musician should not be able to leave the value of his mind to the protection of his widow and children? No. No, he's not done But medication now. should... Well, he backed off a little bit, I admit, by saying, well, perhaps we could protect it for two or three years. But I want to point out that this... Uh, myself, for example, I've had a number of great ideas that I've had other people put into effect. Because oh. I'm at ADH 80. I don't see any future for me to have done so. I, and I could have gone forward myself, but I have no incentive to for the same reason. So most people wouldn't invent anything. Microsoft would not continue to invest in a process that they no longer own. Okay. Now I know something of this directly because I was, I'm tough, this gets into military procurement. I was once, uh, I cut my company's representative to both the Army and the Navy for military spec products in the field of computer connectors and such. I got into that because my Air Force Secret clearance was still current. But let me just close by saying, we did bust our nuts to make our product better than the competitor's property providing the same mill spec. And it's not true there's no competition More in weapons. that field. More weapons? That's you didn't say that it's no competition. You didn't hear. A man of 100 ideas. Yeah, okay. Uh, somebody said here that uh, socialism failed. It didn't fail. You know why? Did you ever hear of China or the Soviet Union having a downturn in its economy, a recession, a depression, a panic they once called it? Every capitalist country known to history has had a panic, a recession, and a, and, a, and a depression. They call it different names, that's all. At one time they used to call it a panic, now they call it recession and depression. And the reason for that is because there was no exploitation of labor in these, uh, in these societies. And they used the uh, surpluses to put back into the economy, into the factories, into the, the um, into, into, um, <clears throat> into education, into the roads, into the hospitals, and everything else. But we have to remember two things about the Soviet Union. One thing, it was invaded by the United States. When they, when they first had the revolution. That's true. Another thing, 14 imperialist countries invaded it. Another thing, if you looked at a map, 
In the 1940s and 50s, especially in the 50s, we had hundreds of bases surrounding that country. When they tried to put one base in Cuba, we almost went to war. And the reason I believe what happened there, Marx uh, prophesied, I didn't prophesy, Marx saw that the only type of society that would go into socialism was a highly developed capitalist society that could feed its own people and provide for the people's needs in these societies. And you had a society in the Soviet Union that was the most backward in all of Europe and had to expand and use its resources for military purposes constantly. And that's one of the reasons why it went down. And it didn't go down from the low, it went down from above. Not only that, if you look at now what's happening in the Soviet Union, you'll find the majority of the people there are going back and looking at the Communist Party yes. and saying, let's vote for them again. That's right. And let's get rid of this Putin. We had far better life before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is very important, and that is what's called NEP, New Economic Policy that was brought in by Lenin when they first had uh, socialism. Because he realized that they had to bring up the economy. And they had to do it with capitalism because they were in such a low stage of development. And that's what's happening today in China. In China, they're using capitalism to develop the economy. So they have a hybrid economy. There's a plan there. And they have five-year plans, just like they had in the Soviet Union. And right now, what's developing there, as far as uh, doing away with pollution and everything, they have a very big plan for solar power and wind power to get rid of these, uh, these fuels, these fossil fuels. And they're moving towards full socialism. That's the important thing. And, the, and, the, and there is no depression there. There is no recession there. There is no panics there. And the society yeah. is going forward. It's made That's tremendous really progress in only 30 years. 30 years with the United States awesome. occupying Formosa or Taiwan, whatever you want to call it. And it's trying to overthrow it constantly, just like it tried to overthrow the Soviet Union. Yes. <laughs> I'm Michael Foley. Robert Burns, I was looking forward to hearing you talk today, and I'm glad I did. I don't want to say anything that's going to sound like I'm belittling you or saying anything degrading about you, because obviously you're an intelligent guy that's thought a lot about a lot of the problems that exist in our country. But I disagree with a lot of them. You're a robber, and you're going to make a good politician. You think that if somebody's got a dollar in his pocket, you think that the government should take it from him. Yeah. Now, about this here net worth tax, somehow all debt is going to get, it's going to disappear somehow. What happens to the people that loan the money to those people that owe the money? What happens to the creditors? Who cares? What happens if a guy lends his friend a thousand dollars? The guy don't have to pay back the thousand dollars. What happens to the thousand dollars? Who's going to pay the guy his thousand dollars that he's owed? Another thing about mortgages. Here's a guy living in a half a million dollar house, even at today's depressed market. And he paid it off because he bought it a long time ago and it was probably only $100,000 and now it's worth a half a million dollars even in today's depressed market and he owns the house and lives in the house. Here's a guy living across the street in the same kind of house. But he owes $450,000 in a mortgage. Somehow the government's going to take the half a million dollar house and kick the guy out of his house and the other guy He's going to get to live in his house and own it, and he don't owe the $450,000 anymore. 
The guy that owns the house, used to own the house, and now he's standing on the street in his shorts and his socks. And the guy that used to owe $450,000 on a house, he don't have it anymore. Now, there's a problem amongst some people. You, Mr. Burns, are one of them. We had a woman here last week. Her name was Dr. Sheets. She's got the same problem. <laughs> you believe in fairy tales. <laughs> Government exists to provide bribes for politicians and jobs for precinct captains. And I'm not opposed to a precinct captain having a job. And government exists to destroy people's lives. That's why we have government in this country. But Dr. Sheets, and you, Mr. Burns, you come here and you tell us government's going to do wonderful things for us. And I can't call you liars because I think you really believe it. I think you really believe that the politicians are going to pass a network tax and somehow they're going to confiscate trillions of dollars from insurance companies, banks, union pension funds, private pension funds. They're going to collect trillions of dollars in assets and property. People have got lots of property, high-rise apartment buildings, high-rise office buildings. The politicians are going to confiscate all that trillions of dollars in money and wealth, and somehow they're going to do something worthwhile for all of us, for all the rest of us. What they're going to do is make buy more jewelry for their whores, they're going to buy more jewelry for their wives, so their wives quit ragging them about their whores. They're going to send their kids off to private school so their kids don't know they have whores. The kids are out of sight. Politicians do not do worthwhile things except for themselves and their lackeys and their whores. That's why our politicians, that's why they take all this pride money called campaign contribution. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, you've been exposed, Burns. Jolly for oars. Rob, Rob, I think from the commentary, you might be willing to think you haven't gotten your idea across. Please speak to the mic. I want to take an objective poll. I want to present three alternatives. Get in front of the mic. Please I want to present. Thank you. Thank you. I want to present three alternatives to the audience. Don't vote yet. Do you think that what Rob is advocating is socialism, or do you think that what he is advocating that's one alternative? And uh, Marxist socialism, red bloody socialism, um, or is he advocating a more truly free market or or are you not sure what it is so let's just see how many people here think that rob's system amounts to just another approach to achieving socialism raise your hands one two three four five six seven did I miss anybody? Eight. Oh, eight. Oh, eight. Okay. How many people think so? That's eight for socialism. Uh, <clears throat> just objectively, how many people think that he is advocating a more truly free market system? One, two, three. Well, you do, yeah. <laughs> four. That's it. Only four. Okay. So. Uh, how many people are not sure what the hell it is anyhow? <laughs> one, one, two, three, three one of the four, others. five, six. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> Is this anybody? I'm not sure if they're not sure. Oh, seven. Well, I think that's eight, twelve. There's 19 votes. I think there's a few more than 19 people here. Anyone want to just briefly shout out the, the, the fourth alternative that they have? If not, Socialism, free markets, or not sure? Chaos. 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 Did you vote before? Yeah. Yeah, well, you don't count. <laughs> <laughs> the advocates of free markets think that socialism is going to be the consequence, and the advocates of socialism think that free markets. I want to bring in the guy who could really decide this. 
for us. I want to follow in the path of Rick Santorum and appeal to God. <laughs> when, Let's hear yes. when, when, mosquitoes. God, when God created, now this is a question I want to ask. I'm using a Sopian language. I happen not to believe in a traditional God, but he's, a very, he's an excellent metaphor. Um, when God created the world, and it, if he did, and if he truly was truly benevolent, was it, was it his intention that um, every generation should share equally in the riches that God put in the earth? You know, he, he knew those animals and plants would decay and would form oil, so there's oil and uh, iron, and of course the fertility of the soil, that in each generation we have an equal, regardless of what other system you're going to apply to it, just start at the beginning, do you believe that the truth is that each generation has inherited from God or the principle of evolution or whatever you want to call it? How many people think that in this generation we have an equal right, each of us has an equal right to the ownership of the resources that God created? How many people think we have that right? No, God created a fucking thing. Right. <laughs> well, it was evolution. Eliminate that part. You know what a Sophian language means? Yeah, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just said, I said, pardon me. If, if whether you believe in God or not, using that as a story, but no one believes that we have an equal right to the uh, all the resources of the earth? I do. Sure, sure. One. Uh, two. Three. Four. Oh, okay, well, one, two, that five, okay, <laughs> only, I think there's, we're, we're breaking down in communicating. Well, right, means the animal Wait, did you let me, did you have a chance to talk here? I didn't interrupt you. God help you. Well, right. Shut the fuck up! Did that get it to you? Um, right. I think we have a distance to go with communicating this system to the We have an equal right to the mic. I have no more time left. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Another minute. Okay. The, the thing I have to say to you directly, Rob, is I think your system is getting down to the basic truth, and the details are really uh, work out pretty well. But here's the problem. Right now in Wisconsin, there's, hundreds, there's uh, over a million citizens uh, who have been activated, at least to the point of signing a petition against that governor. Uh, it's been activated in, in the cause of at least maintaining the gains that labor has made. And they're not advocating your system. They're saying, let's have a, a, a true right to work where the unions can negotiate and, and the, the employer is still free to sign a contract that he will deduct union, weight of union fees from all the workers. They're, they're on the brink of success. If we put you in charge of that program in Wisconsin, you would have the larger truth, but your program would not be understood, and they would be guaranteed to lose if they spent their time advocating your program instead of the very simple idea of let, letting collective bargaining determine the wages of the workers. So I think you have some work to do on how to communicate your ideas to people and how to make them politically effective. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. It's good to hear your presentation. Second time I've heard it, um, and you definitely deserve congratulations on your bold. It is definitely a very bold plan. Um, one observation that I would make, or actually two. One one involves world markets. I find your um, comment about other countries intriguing, and uh, wonder more about how that would work. So perhaps that's something you could address more towards the end. And then also, I wanted to point out that when it comes to um, natural resources and public land, the U.S. government prior to Andrew Jackson would have been an essential agreement with you. Uh, the problem was that they didn't have control over its territory. And so people just went west and they set up wherever they wanted to set up. And the government had the choice of either forcefully evicting them from the land that they had decided to squat on, which they actually owned, or of just giving them the right. And they decided not to fight with them over it, so that's how we got Illinois. So um, what I'm curious about is how you would enforce this redistribution without it ending up becoming a war, because uh, I just don't foresee that happening. Um, switching to something entirely different, I just wanted to again uh, put a plug in for the March 1st Day of Action. 
Um, for those of you who either have family members in colleges and universities or, you know, are just interested in the topic at all, this is definitely something that you'd want to be involved in. There are a number of different ways you can do it. As I said earlier in the day, the NEA is going to be meeting over at the Palmer House. So if you're a morning person, you can stop by there, check out some of the events. There'll be folks out there leafleting and picketing. Also, later in the day, there'll be some events at Columbia College Chicago and also at East West University where some really interesting things have been happening. What's the NEA? National Education Association. Uh, besides the AFT, it's one of the largest educators' unions in the United States. Uh, and then finally, at the end of the day, around 1 to 4, there's a group called the Coalition Against Corporate Higher Education. We'll be meeting at Congress in Michigan. We'll be having a rally there. Many of them are DePaul students, but they're very frustrated at the fact that they have to have a college degree in order to get a job of any kind in this country, and yet the average student graduates with $28,000 in debt, uh, which they'll likely never be able to pay off. Uh, so if you get a chance to check that out, uh, please do come by. Two book recommendations. One, because we do seem to be fighting an awful lot of the battles of the past here in these rooms uh, month after month. I recommend that uh, folks who are interested in where we're at now read David Harvey's book called The Brief History of Neoliberalism. It explains everything that we argue about here almost every month. And then another book uh, regarding higher education that was very educational for me because it pretty much described my experience as a graduate student, um, which is Mark Busquets' book. It's called How the University Works. What was the name of that author? The second one, Mo? Yeah. Mark Busquet. B O U S Q U E T. He's a professor of higher education at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he describes an educational system which is very similar to a lot of the other areas that are being privatized and unbundled, I guess, in the words of the current system, in which graduate students are actually doing most of the work. So you want to know who's teaching your children when they go off to college. It's grad students and people who are ABD, people who are master's students. So all of the professors are actually somewhere else. They're working as administrators or they are uh, doing research in a lab. So that's something you should be concerned about as you're writing checks uh, for the schools you're signing them to. That's it, thanks. Ivan Roy, why are you protesting the NEA? I'm not protesting the NEA. Uh, it's certainly not. <laughs> um, what, I, what I've heard, uh, at least part, part of it that kind of moves me to speak, is um, the speaker wants to address all sorts of evils in our present system with the new system. Um, and, but, but yet we, have, we didn't hear anything from the speaker which suggests that the new system is kind of consistent with human nature as we've come to know it. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I, I'm thinking of uh, United Kingdom's, uh, Great Britain's history uh, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to the present. Uh, and in that period of time, uh, the United Kingdom and the United States have kind of dominated the world. And there's a, uh, and I mean that in a good sense, and I only have four minutes. Um, and, and I think there's a reason for that. And, and, uh, and I think it's because their policies, and their governmental policies, the systems those societies have chosen to adopt is consistent with human nature at its very basic form. And, and in that sense, it's consistent with uh, that articulation. Uh, best, uh, from my recollection, Adam Smith, capitalism. Uh, and that's the reason. It, these, uh, these systems have, at least in my judgment, have been so successful. And, and I don't think your system uh, takes into account those, the historical record. And, and because of that, you may be setting it up, you're setting yourself up, setting the system up for complete failure. Uh, because it's, it, the incentive, disincentive model is completely thrown off, at least, you know, from what I, what I garner from it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, gonna I just fail. wanted to voice that criticism. Thank you. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, Frank Aguilar told me to start looking at things on an evidence-based way of how things actually work around the world. I've really started to take a good, long, hard look at it. And you know what I've been finding out? 
Capitalism really does work if it's done in the right way. Oh. And I'm telling you right now, the main cause of our financial debacle was a direct failure of mercantilism. What you basically have with our present dilemma in the stock market is basically the unregulation of derivatives, which has basically caused the rise of the commercial paper market, which basically what banks did in the, in the, in the 1929, 1930 period. Now, because only five banks control that derivative market, they're able to charge on both ends of the transaction and without transparency in the information they have, they have what we call a monopoly. They have what we call an oligopoly. And because of it, and that crass, unregulated oligopoly allowed a classic oh, run on the bank. And what we're seeing now is a large overextension of credit where they can't pay their bills. And because of that, we're in the present dilemma. Think about, think, think I'm wrong. Take a look back a few years ago when you had a dot-com bust. Enronic, isn't it? Look at the real estate market and our, and our cer certain dilemma. Enronic, isn't it? I'm just going to say this. If you really want true solutions to things like abject world poverty, take a look at the model presented by NARU International, N-A-R-U International. And they've been doing some good work in, the, in Kenya recently. And what is it they do? They go to these abject farmers and these abject places, and they basically give the farmers ownership of their plot of land. They then school them in, you know, basic uh, crop modernizations, and for the first time in their lives, they're getting a surplus. That's Rob's system. And what do they do with their surplus? They then save it, invest it amongst each other, and they, you know, form the basis of a community, and, the, and they form the first time they'll have some government governance. And they're, do, and they're producing some results. If you take a look at their website and some of the things written about them, they actually have a solution to world poverty and some of the abjective poverty that's going on around the world. The reason they chose Kenya first was it was a stable country. They're hoping to export that model to places like Afghanistan, to places like, you know, Iran, to place other places around the world that have the same problem. And you know what's even more funnier? The taking down of dictatorships that all of us want to see armed intervention on and all the other stuff. Look at a, look at a work by the name of Gene Sharp out of, out of Boston, Massachusetts, and his methodology. There's a good documentary that, if you need to see it, it can be fully downloaded off the internet. It's called, I'm forgetting its name, but his work basically has brought, you know, through the, re, through the non-cooperation of the citizens against a, a dictatorial form of government. He's got like 130 plus ways that it can be done. All and it's brought down. And the thing is, there are so much solutions out there that don't need a real radical transformation. Just some tweaking at the edges. You know, for it, just some tweaking at the edges is all we really need. That's right, Tweak it a little bit and we're fine. Well, it's kind of a... If it's profitable, yes. Kind of a combined notion that wealth is very mal distributed. The rich have far too much and the poor have far too little. And what you do is take from the rich and give to the poor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, here, 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 that, 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 You're assuming that very it's very important. It's a very, uh, our speaker tonight, at least has begun to unwind this uh, notion that the present distribution of wealth is not, well, it's, it's basically the result of distribution of wealth, of taking from some and giving to others. And if you cut that out, I think most people, uh, I think there's very few people in this world 
born physically able, physically and mentally able to support themselves. They're not uh, behind, kept out by a picket line or something. But anyway, our speaker tonight at least has got some glimmer of appreciation that this this distribution of wealth, this redistribution of wealth rather, is what's causing the problem. And that kind of agrees with the notion that I've had. And I'll, I've, been, I've, I've thought this for years, and uh, it hasn't gotten too much appreciation around here, but uh, I've, I've come to see recently that allowing landlords to keep a rent on land, not on uh, improvements or on personal property or whatever, but uh, what our speaker described as rent as opposed to the other kinds of rent. That this is a form of redistribution of wealth too. But I think if we can eliminate redistribution of wealth, we don't need these, uh, I mean, I, I think one criticism I would have for this uh, proposal in, the, in this paper here is kind of like uh, unraveling the Gordian knot. I think it has to, it has to be some type of a simple underlying principle, as hard as that might be for some people to, to to comprehend who are so used to redistribution of wealth. Yeah, get to get rid of the one percent. Yeah, yeah, let's get rid of them. Simple. Simple. Not hitting people over the head. Not, not declaring that happiness is a warm baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> I've just recently come across a magazine by this Institute for Justice, which is kind of a libertarian ACLU. <laughs> which uh, fights for the small entrepreneurs. These are uh, what I would call a scab capitalists. I mean, they're, they're kept from making a living by all kinds of government regulations and whatnot, and they fight it in court. I don't know if they've got all the answers, but... Uh, <laughs> so they, they, there is an Institute for Justice website if you want to look it up. <laughs> but anyway... Anyway, uh, I think I think what we got to do is not so much equalize the wealth, but equalize the opportunities. Thanks, Bob, for uh, sharing your ideas with us. Uh, when uh, Mo gave his poll, I had to vote uh, unsure, or you know. But I guess what I was trying to say is, uh, you know, part of your part of your speech is on the right track, and that and that, that track, of course, knowing you know where I'm from, from the Henry George School, uh, is on the, on the taxation of land values. Now, land is a you know. Is a monopoly. Uh, there's only you know a fixed amount of it here, and uh, that is where I believe we can easy, most easily uh, you know collect our government revenues. I do think that uh, the land is our birthright, and we all. How can we all benefit from the bounty of the land? Well, the only way we can all benefit from the bounty of the land is if we share in the rent of it for its exclusive use. So uh, ideally, if, uh, if, the, if the land value tax was high enough, the land itself would have no exchange value. So, uh, you know, if people wanted to buy a house, they would buy a house, they would own the building, uh, and the, you know, things like that. They would not own the land, though. They would just pay, uh, you know, monthly or annual rent to the government for the use of the land. From that, that you know, because of that, we wouldn't have to have income taxes or sales taxes. That would create an enormous economic boom. And also, be, uh, 
if we had a, you know, the, the actual, you know, what we're called, it's called, call, call collecting the economic rent. If we actually paid the, you know, the economic rent for, for land, there would be no land speculation like there is now. The reason we have this depression and the reason we had the big crash on Wall Street and all that was because of land speculation. Yeah, overextension Pe of credit. People want to buy, yeah. Because of this fact that we allow this monopoly in land, we allow, you know, whoever grabs the land, we allow them to keep it and then rent it or speculate, hold it off the market as the price can go up higher uh, and you're getting you know, money for nothing. You can turn around and flip it a year or two later and make five or six hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's very tempting. Everybody wants to get in, get in on a piece of that. And uh, so that's what happened. Uh, that was the source of all the, all the trouble. But if you had a land value tax, uh, you wouldn't have the speculation in land because people wouldn't wouldn't buy land to hold it off the market because of the carrying cost is too high. You would only you know you would rent land uh, if you went if you had a good idea or product to make. Labor and capital then could get uh, uh, a place to build their buildings or you know carry on their business, uh, and we would have you know, a robust economy. Land would be available. And we'd have you know when you have land available, then you have opportunity land. That then creates a seller's market in, labor, in the labor market because people can employ themselves. So right now we're in a situation where there's, you go downtown, there's dozens and dozens of storefronts, prime space that people would like to have their own business uh, in, you know, and, and, and have a space downtown, but they don't do it because the rent is too high. And uh, so they, they, they can't do it. Labor and capital can't come together. So therefore, uh, people are unemployed and then there's you know less uh, products being purchased and supplies and it creates a chain this. reaction. But anyway, you can go to the Henry George School and learn all about this. But that's the, that's the main thing. Now, by the way, land, in the economic term, land is all physical, you know, all natural physical things. So that includes the radio spectrum. Uh, that includes water. I mean, you know, because underneath that water is land. So anything natural, any natural thing, that is actually land in the economic sense of the word. The sun. Uh, How about airplanes? Well, airplanes, no, airplanes is capital. That's something that was created by, that was something we built. We built. Uh, another thing I want to touch on here is this idea that, uh, um, uh oh, I'm out of time, so I'm going to touch on that. But. Next I do thank the speaker for coming, and I do think that he presented an interesting talk. I disagree with a good deal of what he said. I don't think it's very realistic. <laughs> and number two, much of it, I asked a question earlier about wasn't this tried in Britain already? Yes, it has, and Margaret Thatcher got killed off most of it. Now, I'm not an admirer of Margaret Thatcher by any means, but most of Western Europe has walked away from essentially what you're proposing. Uh, that's number one. Second, I raised the issue earlier about what happens when somebody owns land and somebody else, or maybe them, they themselves, find that there's a valuable mineral on it. Yes, I think that time will be compensated for it, and I don't think there's anything immoral, uh, anything immoral about it. I agree that sometimes it's immoral when the U.S. government happens to own the land and, let, and, and lets uh, the mineral rights get away for an absurdly low price yeah. at the yeah. instigation of the mineral company. That's something else again. But the mere fact that somebody owns a piece of land gets compensated because somebody finds mineral wealth on it, uh, I don't think that's immoral. And I also disagree with the resident Georgists around here who seem to think that simply owning land is, is somehow immoral. Um, thank you. Oh. Owning land is immoral? The last speaker. Oh, immoral, you own land. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a problem. This guy thinks he can.
Uh, you know, the uh, the people of Jesus Christ were rather. I knew it. The people of Jesus Christ were living in the Roman Empire. Uh, Adjudicating disputes and all of these things, and I think those powers are there whether we want them or not. You know, that's that's kind of that 
the Hobbesian state, you know, if you, if you get rid of government itself, the government proper, then we, we adjudicate our disputes amongst ourselves, and that's one outcome. And if you put in government with a long tradition of law, you come up with another outcome. And, and I prefer the latter <laughs> than, than us just fixing up uh, our disputes amongst ourselves. I, if we can do it peaceably, that's great. But I like the fact that we have a court system we can turn to and, and uh, criminal laws and things like that to protect us. So the issue is we have these governmental powers, and they're there. And should we subordinate them to a legislature? Should we have no taxation without representation? Or should we go ahead and allow lots of taxation without representation? Should we allow plutocracy, government run as a plutocracy, rather than government run as a democracy? That's the issues I'm raising here. Because that's, I'm, not, I'm not talking about making government larger. I think, I think this will make government smaller. Eliminating the duplicate bureaucracies and natural monopolies will make the, the government smaller in that sense. Because AT&T and Verizon are operating as governments, whether we want to call them that or not. So if you have one instead of two, that's smaller government. And it's government focused on the needs of the people. I mean, that's where I think the socialism comes in. You know, like in, in, in American history, there was a, there was a big focus on the liberty. But the, others, the other parts of the French motto of, uh, was it liberty, equality, and fraternity, or liberty, equality, so solidarity, I like to use. Um, but it was, it was in relation to the government. Should we have liberties in relation to the government? Should the government should be restricted from imposing upon us should we be e treated equally by the government? Not should we be equal and equalize our wealth and our income and all that, but shouldn't government treat us all the same, not some with a privilege and others with not? And so it's, it's when, and so I'm saying government should wield those governmental powers that the legislature should be in control and all the revenues from those monopoly rents should go to the public treasury. And when they don't, like if we're going to grant copyrights and we're going to grant patents, we're going to grant other places where someone can take the fruits of someone else's labor, basically exercise a governmental power. We should be very careful about that, because it's taxation without representation. So that's, that's one of the, the things I want to stress. Um, also, I think uh, in terms of socialism and, and like the Soviet experience or previous experience, I really don't see it. I don't see uh, Britain trying this or Western Europe or Eastern <laughs> Europe or anywhere. Because, um, because the, I think the key thing is, they didn't take seriously the problem of rent and the problem of privilege and all of those things. And they also don't take the, the Green Party value of decentralization serious enough. So the idea is, with economies of scale, when natural monopoly arises because there's economies of scale, because there's things more efficient done in a larger scale. I would produce everything in my own house if I could. But every once in a while, there's things I can't produce, so I have to, collect, I have to become collectively involved with other people to be able to satisfy these needs, or it's much easier than doing it all alone. So when that happens, let's be democratic about it. If we have to collectivize, let's and let's uh, let the government uh, manage those natural monopolies for us. Um, let's see, market. So that question that Mo raised, that you know, did you see this as market? I, I thought that was interesting. You know, is this socialism or is it free markets? And the the thing is, again, that's another one of those false dichotomies. I am not uh, that socialism. You know, at least if you're going to call it socialism, it has nothing to do with ending free markets. The markets are free. The government is going to impose less upon our free commerce and free contract with one another. Only, only with uh, our own bodies. It, government will not enforce a contract that sells yourself into slavery, and government will not enforce a contract that leases yourself even. That if you want to collectively produce with other people, you've got to do it in a corporation or some other collective democratic enterprise. So. That's the only only restriction on commerce is when, when you're selling a human being and the government will act as the proprietor of all the natural resources, so you can't. Um, but I'm not, uh, and I'm also I'm not, I wouldn't call it market socialism that I'm proposing because I'm also, I think we need to less, uh, put less emphasis on markets. They're not the be-all, end-all. Again, there's, there's, there's another way of producing. People come to think of it as a, market, as a government producer, as a market producer. Well, there's also direct production, and you can produce, again, produce things for yourself in your house. You're not going through the market at all, and I think one of the things this does is it, it allows a proliferation of, of diversity in the economic systems, and government should facilitate that diversity. That's part of equal protection, again, providing people the opportunity to pursue their own interests in their own ways, and, and that way involve no markets, and it make, it make it easier for people to produce for themselves at their home, but, you know, provide their own daycare rather than having to buy it from the market, because they split the family up and make it work 80 hours a week, 
each, per, each parent instead of 40 hours a week like we had before. So there's all kinds of things that change, that force us into the market through government policy. Um, let's see. But, oh, on the settlement of the West, I, I think that's an interesting case. I, again, this is where I'm talking about, like, uh, if we're going to allow rent-seeking, maybe people, people went West, you know, for the gold rush, for instance. That's obviously rent-seeking. There was gold out there. There was a lot of money to be made. You know, I, I would say, you know, this, this constitutional amendment would have allowed that. I don't know if, should, if, if, if Congress should have then allowed it or not, but they would have allowed it. Would, did it serve us? I don't know. But the focus should be on what's the public interest. And also, not, not so much on morality. What's the, what's the morality of charging rent or the morality of, of employing other people? But what's in the public interest? If we're going to do these things collectively, we're talking about being a public. What's in the public interest? So, for instance, Alaska now gives, gives their dividend. They have a dividend they give for oil to their, to their residents, of the citizens of Alaska. Is that the public interest? So my proposal would bring those revenues into the federal treasury. And we might give a div we could give a dividend in some strange circumstances or not. But but the uh, question is why are we promoting settlement of Alaska? Is that really in the public interest? Is that in our nation's interest? I mean, I'm not saying I'm against it, but should we do it to such an extent that we give people we, we pay them extra money to go there? I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the idea that they're Alaska money unspoiled or. Uh, you know, I see no reason that that serves public interest, but that's something we can debate. I, but I'm just saying that we, we don't, we can't debate it because it's not, because we haven't structured our constitution in the right way that it becomes something to debate. It's just done. Um, Do you really think it's viable? I mean, uh, the government took away the land from the Indians who owned it, <laughs> and now it gives them pennies, literally. Yeah. So you think in this day and age it's possible to get them to redistribute the wealth to us now. I think it's impossible. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm interested in politics because uh, and policy because I think we can change things. I don't think we have to accept it the way it is. I don't think we have to accept it the representation, the taxation without representation, the plutocracy that, that rules over us when that's not in our constitution. That's not the intent of our framers. And it's not, I mean, you talk about, so people keep bringing up Adam Smith writing about capitalism. He doesn't mention capitalism in the book. Uh, it, it wasn't a word that came about until the, late the next century. And it, it didn't come up until the next century. So capitalism, I think, it, it's been a rhetorical move in the 20th century to equate capitalism with markets. He wrote about markets. Adam Smith wrote, wrote about the benefits of the markets. He didn't write about capitalism. Capitalism got written about in the 19th century by Proudhon and Marx and Owen and Ricardo. And they started to recognize that there's this insidious thing that goes on when you, when you have a market, but then you, you don't go to the market to get what you need, but you rather go to the market just to make, turn money into more money. And you become completely focused on doing that only and subordinate all other things to that, to that aim. Um, also, so on the idea of, uh, Ivan raised the question of consistency with human nature. This is, uh, I think this is, you know, this actually misunderstands it. I probably didn't present it well enough, but to me, I'm trying to align those incentives. In other words, if someone doesn't live off the fruits of your labor, you keep more of what you do, and therefore you have an incentive to work harder than you do now. So if, if someone exploits you, or takes rents, or uh, because they've been granted a, a forever patent in something or copyright and then therefore can charge you enormous exorbitant fees for something that's vital to, to living today, um, like computers and things like that. Well, the government is granting them a governmental power, a private privilege and a governmental power to take from you the fruits of your labor and that's less incentive to do that. So this tries to realign it in just the ways that advocates of markets want to do so that you keep more of the fruits of your labor, you have more incentive to work hard. You have more incentive to, to do innovative things and, and uh, come up with new ideas. Um, Bob, on the, on the Henry George issue of taxation of land value, I think part of the problem is, and I don't think Henry George does this much until maybe later writing, but I think calling it a tax on land value is a confusing thing because it, in an economic sense, land has no value. It's, it's, not, it's not something produced. You know, if, if we talk about markets being, we should all be compensated for the things we bring to the table. Well, if I bring the sun to the table, you're going to be like, you didn't bring the sun to the table, you know? You didn't bring the earth to the table. There's, so why should someone be compensated for, the, for bringing the sun to the table when they didn't really do that? They're just saying they did it. So, but, it, but if I bring this computer, like I made it from scratch, 
then I've, I've put something into it, and, and if we exchange then things that you did also from scratch and, and exchange them equally, then we're, we're not exploiting and we're not well. taking lens. We're not taking the fruits of other people's not labor. Earth. But if I can say, the sun, I'm bringing the sun to the table, now I'm going to charge you for your use of the sun, and then you give me the fruits of your labor in exchange. Well. He's I'm not exchanging the fruits of my labor for the fruits of your labor. I'm exchanging nothing for something. <laughs> so much for well, everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is trying to align those incentives and, and actually make, make work more uh, uh, better rewarded for actually working and, and less rewarded for doing nothing. You know, so that's what uh, I think this does a lot more to uh, okay. Um, Time to wrap it up, George. Oh, and, and then on the issue, someone raised the issue of Apple yeah. and Microsoft. They're not going to do anything if, if it's in the public domain. I disagree. I think, like I said, both of them are really, they're adept in their own operating systems better than anybody. If, if, if like, the current version, you know, 10.7 and Windows 7 or whatever, if those both just came in the public domain, everything's visible, everyone can see it, it's going to take us years or decades to pour into that and learn how to use it and do things with it. And they'll be forging ahead, and they'll be given copyrights in what they do in the future. It's just they'll have to compete with themselves from the past. You know, that's, you know, and it sort of levels up. I mean, you, Apple is the, I don't know, the highest profiting corporation of all time, I think, now, if I, if I heard that right. I mean, it is, it is the enjoyment of a monopoly that perhaps they should enjoy. And so the issue of copyrights and patents, I'm not trying to deny someone a poem, a poet there, uh, Fruits of labor. My name's Robert Burns. How could I do that? Uh, so, but yeah, I think there's a question: Should it go to, the, to their, their inheritance? Should it be inherited? Does that, if it's meant to assign an incentive to people to, to uh, yeah, it's now seventy-five years plus. The yeah, that's a that's a quite an incentive. I think. And, and most poets, most poets would do it just for the fun of it. You know? like, they have a natural curiosity okay. to go past what they love. And I think there's a third category that we're missing. We're, we have cop patents for nineteen years or seventeen years or whatever. We have copyrights for. Uh, uh, Sam, what did you, what'd you say for seventy-five years? And then I, there's another thing that we're not granting intellectual property and that I think falls in between, or maybe even should be beneath patents, and that's algorithms. You know, there's a skill to writing an algorithm, but it's not the same as a poem or a song or a work of art. Or uh, I, I, think, I think for our own good, for the public good, it would be better if we granted algorithms a shorter period of time, maybe more flexible, like uh, you know, if it does start to pay off, you, know, you took a delay to pay off, then you get some more time or something like that. But, but, you know, restart. That's what would happen. That's all right. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.